Zombie Brush. Zombie Brush Studios. Do the snozberries taste like snozberries? Or rather, rather, does it taste like snozberries, he asks me. To which I can only reply, Zombie Brush. We are the music makers. We are the dreamers of dreams. How's everybody doing today? How are we doing? The world changed yesterday. The texture of filmmaking as we know it has shifted. We have reached a singularity. Um, the greatest movie ever made. Is my voice a little bit muffled? Is that just me? Maybe it's just... Oh, it's because my headphones were on funny. Um, the greatest film in the history of mankind was released, and it is going to change all of our lives. Godzilla vs. Kong will make you weep. It'll make you think. It will inspire in you thoughts like how long has this movie been on and um who's that again was she was she in the other movie <laughs> oh my god <laughs> um yeah i'm being sarcastic i'm i'm being i'm being very sarcastic if, that, if that's not painfully obvious at this point how are we doing today Everyone, there is White Wolf. There is our very own Gray Fox. How you doing, buddy? If you're not following him on Instagram, you should go give him a follow. Darkheart X9, good to see you. Hello, Roland to Square. Thank you so, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the subscription to Square. I really appreciate it, man. I'm glad to see you in chat too. How much pain are you eating? I mean, you know, uh, no, it's not. It's not. It's not a good idea. I just sort of do it anyway. There's Sumatha also on that 12 month. Streak, holy shit! Thank you so much, Sumitha. Thank you so much for your support. Um, I ran off the very final pieces of your prints. Actually, I was just that—that that was what delayed me as I was removing them from their supports. Um, assuming they don't warp like the previous round did, which I think I solved that, then I should be able to get those uh, over to you right quick. The man, the myth, the legend. Where? Who? Huh? Stila? Stila on a train, I am sick and tired of these motherfucking Stilas on this motherfucking train. Wait, that's a different movie. And it, it wasn't a train. I don't even know where that came from. I was just like channeling the spirit of Sam Jackson there. Who isn't dead, but I think it's it's possible to argue that the fun Sam Jackson kind of is. He's just sorta He's just sorta cashing checks now. I mean he's just he's just sorta coasting through his career, cashing checks on the same performance over and over, and I have to say I'm here for it. It's actually pretty entertaining. Yeah, that's the. <laughs> it is. Uh, it is in fact April first, so the whole stream being the waiting screen would be kind of, uh, kind of appropriate. I don't do April Fool's jokes. I fucking hate April Fool's jokes. As someone who whose birthday is April second, I have been the butt of so many stupid fucking April Fool's jokes in my life. It's just. They're not funny. Everybody does them every year, and particularly if you're into, like, wargaming, it's always like, oh, today's the day that all the companies who don't have a fucking sense of humor are going to post some stupid joke, and a bunch of people are going to fall for it, and there's going to be an argument on Facebook, and blah, 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 blah. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it, you guys. I've had enough of it. Yeah, that's smart. You should. You should forget about April 1st, Steel a Rebel. It's a stupid fucking tradition. Oh, my God. Is it that bad? It's not... Here's the thing, Sumith. I'll give you my honest thoughts on on Godzilla vs. Kong. I will. Uh, Daytron Voltar, I finally watched Pacific Rim. The Black was left feeling distinctly meh. Yeah, I was, like, more excited about Pacific Rim The Black uh, five episodes in than I was seven episodes in. Like, in episode four or five, it was like, it was an interesting idea. Um, using the drift as a method of interrogating people and fooling people. I was like, eh, it's a little darker than anything that Guillermo would have done because the drift is supposed to be about honesty and not deception. But, uh, okay, it's a different writer. Fine, whatever. It, it, humans would do that, sure. That's a cool idea. But they just, like, the very ending of it, when it's like a kaiju cultist shows up and they're like, he has come. He is risen. Kai Jesus is among us. I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. No, let's, uh... 
what are we what are we doing here man like what what the hell's the point of any of this dark heart thank you very much in my uh lumbar support positioned properly hamburg tack i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and hydrate with with a little bit of fat tire if you don't mind your sister just bought a delorean uh why the delorean is um it's just a waste of money, as far as I know. It's not like it's a great car. Did your raid fail? Did Oh, no, your raid came in. It just didn't alert me for some reason. I see it right there in chat, though. Riot Sister! Riot Sister! Thank you so much. Welcome in, raiders. Welcome in. Did CGL do April Fool's jokes? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what they are, and I don't care. None of them are funny. Uh, the saddest thing for me surrounding April Fools is that Blizzard used to do April Fools jokes and then as time went on and they ran out of ideas and became creatively bankrupt, they started doing their actual April Fools ideas as expansions to their games. And I like I don't know how to better illustrate said creative bankruptcy in Blizzard as a company than by pointing out that they have released expansions to World of Warcraft that were literally April Fool's jokes from about a decade earlier. It's just like, I mean, there it is. It's It should be self-evident. It's April 2 here. Happy Butt Day! It's not, no, we don't we don't have butt days. Butt days aren't a thing, Steel. It's a, it's a birthday. I realize that you've been in the East for some time, but here, they're not generally known as butt days. You're gonna you're gonna have a lot of acclimation to go through when you when you return, return to the West. Yeah, no, it's it's just obnoxious. It really, guys, you're never gonna get April Fool's jokes out of me because I, I genuinely loathe them. And for the most part, you're not going to find that I'm I'm terribly receptive to them. If there's like one out there, we're like, oh, this one's really funny. I want to share it with people. Uh, you know, share it, share it with people. Um, don't don't share it with me. I don't I don't care. I don't care. I'm a big fucking party pooper. Ah, oh man, what do we got? It was cute in like elementary school. I don't even think it was cute then. Like again, I had I had maybe a negative, um, particularly negative personal experiences with it because of it being my birthday. Everyone thinks it's so funny. Everyone thinks it's so fucking funny. Ooh, I got him a gift and it was in a big box, but then you open it up and it's really small. <laughs> April Fools. Like yeah, it wasn't even funny the first time. It, it was always disappointing, and it's just sort of come to annoy me on almost every level. To be fair, they've been talking about the sisters and the weird kaiju worshipping stuff a couple episodes prior. Yeah, I know they, like, mentioned it, Sumitha, but it was, like, the very last line of the show. I, I like, I remember seeing the, the, the cultist characters and being like, oh, okay, that's strange, but, you know, okay, sure, whatever. And then at the end of it, they were literally like, it is the Kaiju Messiah. And I'm like, ow. Oh. I also didn't particularly love how the kid actually turned into a Kaiju spontaneously, like, just generated a bunch of biomass and became some kind of weird grunt. He looked like, you know, <laughs> you know what he looked like? I'm sorry, guys, spoilers for Pacific Rim the Black. There's a kid that turns into a Kaiju. Um, he looked like, what was his name? Stripe from Gremlins 2? Do you remember? No, it wasn't Gremlins 2. He was in Gremlins 1. What was the, um, there were a bunch of evil Gremlins in Gremlins 2, but I don't remember the names of any of them. But yeah, Stripe, the, the evil head Gremlin from Gremlins 1. That's what he looked like to me. I think Gremlins 1 was better written. In fact, I know it was, because Gremlins a good movie. Um... I don't know. I just was like, eh, eh. They did some cool things. They did some stupid things. We'll see what direction they take it in if they manage to continue it. Maybe Kaiju Jesus gives the big donations. Ooh, you might be onto something there. You might be onto something there, Zombie Brush. Kind of meta in a weird way. Yeah, the fact that they foreshadowed it doesn't make it, like, good. <laughs> you know? I can I can foreshadow a shitty plot twist all I want. That doesn't make it clever. Uh, this is Stila's stop. Gundam awaits. That's right. Stila's gonna go check out the big Gundam, the big Gundam that they have there in Japan. Gonna go gonna go take some pictures. Gonna go see it lift its leg and, and move it back and forth awkwardly as the big Gundam does. I think the Gundam, the Gundam statue in Japan is maybe the strongest argument against the notion that Gundams are possible because it's so awkward. <laughs> it moves so like there. It's clear that the big uh, difficulty there was how do we make it move? 
These legs are really heavy, you guys. They're made of metal. It has to move very slowly. I don't know. That's the thing, though, Sumitha. I don't know that I want them to do anything different with the IP. If they have to do something different, I prefer... I, I guess I prefer the black to Uprising. I have to say that. That doesn't make it good, though. I, I don't know. They can take Season 2 in a lot of directions, and depending on what they focus on, it can still be good. I was just very, very thrown by that development at the end. Like, I, I involuntarily rolled my eyes a little bit, and that's never a good sign in something that I've already accepted being that cheesy. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Doesn't let kid generating biomass turn into a kaiju, but loves attack on Titan to square. There is a distinct difference there. There is a distinct difference there in that... If you've watched Attack on Titan, I don't think this this counts as spoilers. The fact that Titans come out of nowhere, the fact that Titans shouldn't be able to walk at the size that they are, the fact that Titans are lighter and less dense than they should be while still being confusingly strong, these are things that are noted in the show, like characters go, isn't it weird that Titans can walk when they're as big as they are? Shouldn't they collapse under their own weight? Uh, there's at one point that a Titan's arm is cut off and a character notes, like, I could put my hands under it and I could lift the Titan's arm off the ground. This thing should, based on the size of it and based on it being a human, this should weigh uh, hundreds to hundreds of pounds up to a ton. I should not be able to lift this, but it's, it's weirdly light. Like, it just kind of, huh, isn't this odd? Because that's part of the story. It's part of the story that Titans should not exist, should not be possible. It's part of the writing. Um, God damn, that show's so well written. I don't know if, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know how many people watch Attack on Titan, but we just got to the, ironically, the end of the final season, only to find out that the final season is actually going to be final season part one and two, which I think we all saw coming, because it's like getting close to the end, and it was like, oh, there's no way they're wrapping this up. This, why does it? Why didn't it recognize your your raid, Riot Sister? But here we have Mellow Minis coming in with a raid of his own, and for whatever reason, Twitch is like, yeah, we can go ahead and recognize that one. We're not we're not gonna recognize Riot Sister, but we'll recognize Mellow Minis. <laughs> Oh man, thank you for getting that shout out done. Riot Sister, welcome in Raiders. It won't trigger if the raid is less than five. I did not know that. I did not realize that. Huh. Okay. Welcome in Raiders, welcome in Mellow Minis. I hope you've been having fun. We're uh We're gonna be getting started painting here in just a just a minute. We we literally just started our stream. We're like uh, I guess twenty minutes in, but I was it was a waiting screen for like ten of those minutes, so I don't count those. I'm going to be painting some Warcaster today. Mellow Minis, what were you working on, man? How's your stream going? Honestly expecting we're going to learn that the aliens introduced human form kaiju as part of a plan to get past the human defense system. That's the Terminator plot, Sumitha. I assume... Uh, okay, we'll, we'll make a bet. Because my assumption is that Kai Jesus, Kaiju Jesus, is a human attempt to create a single human being that is controllable, that can pilot a Jaeger entirely on its own, which explains why Kai Jesus has the connection with the Mecha Kaiju. Like, this is gonna be a human attempt to make a single pilot uh, Jaeger. Kind of like they did in Uprising, but they were like, oh, we can't use a Kaiju brain for that, we have to, uh, we have to crossbreed humans and Kaiju. I'm a writer, I get paid money. Oh my god, my god. This is a painting stream? I feel sober. No, no, uh, This we're just going to critique bad movies. That's all we actually do here. <laughs> Please do. Yeah, Mellow Minis. Ooh, 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 Mellow Minis. Put it up on the Storm Report. If you don't mind, uh, pop over into the Discord and post it in the Storm Report because that way we will all be able to see it at the end of the stream and we'll take some time and we'll uh, we'll have a look at it. I haven't done anything from the Artisans Guild. I haven't done anything from Artisans Guild. I see their stuff everywhere. Everybody seems to like them really, really well. I have not personally printed or painted any of their minis. But I love seeing the work that people do on them. So, um... Yeah, Godzilla vs. Kong is a fucking stupid movie. Like, I, don't, I don't feel like that's taking anybody by surprise when I say it. Uh... It's just dumb. 
I'm not even saying I didn't enjoy it. Like, I didn't enjoy large portions of it. And then I very much enjoyed the parts when it was just like lizard monkey punching. Just punching each other. I think they did a really good job on the monster fighting. They showed the the strengths of the two monsters. Um, they really gave Kong the edge when it comes to speed and agility. And had him get just like fucking wrecked when Godzilla got a hold of him. Which was cool. I like that. And um, then there were parts where it was like human human characters. Look, here's a human being. And he's talking, and he, you know, he, he has this personality, and you should care about him. And I'm like, mm, no. No. I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I've never seen a performance so flat out of any of the Scars Guards. Yeah, it came out yesterday, Mellow Minis. Um... I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to drop a big spoiler on everybody right now. And it's not a spoiler. I am going to keep telling you guys this. This is not a spoiler. What I'm saying is not a spoiler. Because the movie opens on a shot of a sign. Maybe it doesn't open on the shot, but it like opens on Hong Kong and then it pans over to the sign or it opens on Pensacola and it and it pans over to the sign. Oh no, people die. I think that in fact that may be one of my main complaints about the movie is that they offhandedly kill upwards of like a hundred to two hundred thousand living, breathing human beings. And at no point do any of the characters even acknowledge that it's happening. You see multiple uh, you see an aircraft carrier and a few destroyers and at least a couple of frigates from the United States Navy get completely obliterated, fully crewed. And no one bats a fucking... They don't even mention it. I think at one point, one of the characters goes like, Oh, we sacrificed a lot of lives to get this far. That's the whole mention. That, that is it. That is, they never mention it again. And that then later again, they kill... It has to be upwards of 100,000 people. Because they're not... There's no scene where it's like, Oh, they're evacuating the city. They don't like cut to people, you know, running away or going into shelters or getting on boats. It's just like, here's a major populated city and Godzilla is sweeping his beam through many, many skyscrapers full of people. Like... Um... Okay. See, Drakari, this is a funny thing because that part was stupid. But that stupid I was on board with. Uh, not not to not to make a pun because that'd be a bad one, um, but there's a scene when they're fighting on some ships and yeah, like Kong kind of runs and jumps across a few ships and then Kong and Godzilla are both on an aircraft carrier and they're rah, 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 and they're fighting, and yeah, none of that's even remotely possible, like not even a little bit. But I don't I don't give a shit. I'm like I I understand the scene. They're doing that Evangelion scene when they were fighting on the ships and I'm like I'm fine with it. Yeah, a little a little busy, Doctor Rhino. I'm sorry, but hit me up a little bit later, man. Um, by the way, hey, Dr. Rhino, go ahead and go ahead and hit me with a... So, somebody give a shout-out to Dr. Rhino, a streamer you should really be following if you're not. But again, Drake Kari, I was fine with that. Because I'm like, I get the scene. They're fighting on the ships. It's a set piece. I don't really care if the ships can support it or not. What bothered me is that they didn't seem to give a shit about the people that died. Um... But yeah, okay, so the, so the movie opens with a shot of, like, Pensacola, Florida, and then it sweeps down and it shows a sign for a company called... Apex Cybernetics. So, you know what? I'm not even going to give you the spoiler. I'm going to let you guess what the spoiler is. Can someone in chat guess what the spoiler is based on that information alone? The movie begins with a shot of a sign. And the sign says, Apex Cybernetics. Yeah, it's fucking Mechagodzilla. Like, of course Mechagodzilla's in the goddamn movie. <sighs> that, okay, that part was cool. Like, literally everything leading up to the reveal of Mechagodzilla was tedious, boring, and straight up, like, painfully badly written. The di like, uh, Millie Bobby Brown, everything Millie Bobby Brown did in the movie was terrible. It was, like... It all tried to be, like, jokey and Avengers, you know, Joss Whedon were making jokes. And it was like, none of you motherfuckers know how to write a joke because they came off so bad. Just embarrassingly bad. They just blunder into secret laboratories over and over. 
where there's no security. Like, they find this place by sneaking into a busted up building, and they're like, oh, look, a mysterious elevator. I'm not even kidding you. Literally, they go, oh, look, there's a mysterious elevator, and they push the button, and it opens, and they go in, and it goes down, and they're like, oh, we're in a secret laboratory, and nobody notices. And then they're like, oh, we need to hide in this thing. And then the thing takes them to another secret laboratory. And they're like, oh my god, we're in a second secret laboratory. And then they wander right into a room. And in that room is Mechagodzilla. Like, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> um, but that said, Mechagodzilla is very cool. Very, very cool. I, 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 I don't think it's a spoiler at all to say Mechagodzilla is in the movie. I think this should encourage you actually to watch it more. Because the scenes that he's in are fucking cool. The, they clearly focused almost all of their time and attention on the, okay, the monsters are fighting now. And, ooh, that part's really fucking neat. It, it's well uh, designed, the concept is solid, the uh, choreography, I think, is really, really good. Very entertaining to watch. But you can literally fast forward through every single goddamn scene with Millie Bobby Brown. It will cut about a half an hour out of the movie, and I promise you, I promise, this is, okay, you can hold me personally responsible if I'm wrong. You will miss nothing. You will miss not one goddamn thing in the movie if you fast forward through every single scene that Millie Bobby Brown is in. I don't know why she's in the movie. There's no interesting developments whatsoever. All you need to see is Apex Cybernetic Signs, Godzilla Attacks, later on Mecha Godzilla. That's it. You're done. That's all she brings. To be fair, Sumitha, a lot of the human stories crammed into... The Japanese have done a good job at cramming human stories into kaiju movies. Historically. Since the 50s. Not, not always. Not always. Sometimes they're really shitty. Okay, fair enough. Better than American remakes have, though. Um, like, like, like when they sort of jammed what's his name? What was it Raymond Burr into the 1954 Godzilla? It was like, let's cut away from the monster action and have this guy be like, mm, yes, I'm smoking a cigarette. What are we gonna do about this big lizard? Oh, let's evacuate that building. Let's talk about this for 20 minutes. Okay, back to the lizard. Like. Why, why are you here? You're just here to explain, like, the plot, like, the, the, the subtext of the film to American audiences? Uh, I didn't hate the human... Yeah, Drake, Drake Hari, I don't think you're wrong. I think that the human drama surrounding Kong himself was like, it wasn't good. But it was like, uh, okay, alright, yeah, sure, fine, whatever. The kid, the sign language with the monkey, and the monkey's like, I know sign language, and I mean, if you don't see that coming, you're just not watching the fucking movie. What got me, though, is that they're like, ah, Kong speaks sign language, and this woman, who is known as the Kong Whisperer, who's been studying him for the last, like, 20 years, is like, oh my god, I had no idea! Like, you weren't... you didn't... you weren't watching him? <laughs> like, how do you not know this? <laughs> Uh, I'm, uh, you know what, Mello? I consider that to be a spoiler. What you're asking about who fights who, that's the only thing in the movie I consider to be a spoiler, and I want to leave that for you to discover. You can already guess what happens, I'm sure, but that part is fun to watch play out. The fact that Mechagodzilla is in the movie is n I do not consider a spoiler. Um, but, but what actually happens in the fight, like, that's the meat of the film, and that you should just watch. I would be much more harsh on this film if I wasn't able to watch it in my house on my uh, on my couch, though. That was that was nice because I could literally fast forward through the parts that I didn't want to see. I watched them because I'm like, maybe they're going to say something important. They never did. They never ever did. Well, I say modern kaiju films because at least the original classic kaiju films had some kind of heart, and Pacific Rim had heart, man. Guillermo gets it. Uh, Shin Godzilla was fantastic. Guys, if you haven't seen Shin Godzilla, do yourself a favor and go watch it. That movie's fan fucking -tastic. Shin Godzilla's really good. I love that movie. But hey, we're here to paint models, right? Let's do some of that. I have a hard time believing that many people went to theaters to watch Godzilla vs. Kong right now. Like, most of the views had to be on HBO Max. 
it is too much. This is a conversation I was having earlier about how in the West, in America, we don't have we don't have the other half of the equation that developed over the course of the existence of kaiju movies. We have some of the kaiju movies, and then we got movies about big monsters destroying cities. We very rarely have any of the subtext, and I don't like what they've done with this version of Godzilla, by the way. They've made him, like, he is an ancient protector of the planet. And, uh, okay, one of the scenes with Millie Bobby Brown straight up pissed me off, because I just want to say that the, um... The evil character, the bad guy in the movie, the bad guy, he's portrayed as a bad guy, he's the one who's, like, building Mechagodzilla. He is portrayed as, like, some kind of dick. And all I could think the whole time was, he's the only human character who's saying anything that makes sense. He was the only one saying anything that made sense. He was he was breaking out the Lex Luthor angle where he was like, hey, Godzilla destroyed half the planet. Maybe we should have something that could stop him from doing that at some point, pretty please. And they're like, no. No, we need to trust in the lizard. You evil man, you. <laughs> ah, Fang and Claw Hobbies. Welcome in. Thank you so much for the raid, man. Fang and Claw, what were you painting today? I didn't get a chance to stop in earlier. Welcome in, Raiders. We're just getting started here. I'm bitching about Godzilla vs. Kong. Um, you're probably going to get a couple spoilers for that movie if you care about it. I'm going to tell you right now that anything I drop as spoilers, like, it's not, it's not really. I promise you, I promise you, if you are familiar at all with Godzilla as a character or the history of the films, you know everything that's going to happen in this movie. <laughs> Yeah, I know that they've kind of painted him before as the protector of the Earth. I just always hate that angle to Godzilla. I prefer the classic Godzilla as a walking nuclear disaster. As a, as a you know, a, a big shambling holocaust is what he is. And they did that really well in Shin Godzilla. They made Godzilla into a real abomination in Shin Godzilla. I only found out today, and I feel like a fucking idiot for not knowing this, that Shin Ultraman is being made by the same writer-director combo. And I'm very excited for that. Apparently, it was it was delayed by COVID, like almost everything else. Um, but they're still aiming at a release here in 2021? I'm excited about that because as I recall Ultraman had a lot to do with um, pollution as a big theme like he could only transform into ultra like they, they all the Ultramans have had like a glowing oh no oh here's the other thing zombies zombie brush studios I swear to god Godzuki is in this movie I swear to god Godzuki is in this movie he's on screen for like a fraction of a second but I swear it's Godzuki. That was one thing where I was like, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> the action's fantastic. Every time two monsters are fighting each other, I'm like, I'm with it. But it's the like 20 minute gap where Cardboard Cutout A is arguing with Cardboard Cutout B that I'm like, just shut the fuck up. Stop it. It's not going anywhere. I, like I said before, I've never seen a Skarsgård, any of the Skarsgård brothers or father, deliver a performance so flat, trite, and meaningless in my life. I feel sure that the other Skarsgård's brothers have to be making fun of him actively as we speak. And he's, he's you know, as I said in Discord, he's, he's fanning himself with $100 bills in the meantime. Yeah, that's just it. Uh, what, what, what am I gonna, what am I gonna call you? Zero 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 one zero 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 you I, I need I need some shorthand man what would you prefer and yeah that 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 it was a lot of bureaucracy the movie because Shin Godzilla was it, it had a number of themes in it and one of the primary uh, metaphors was not metaphors necessarily uh, but comparisons would be the way that the Japanese government handled the Fukushima disaster and the fact that that particular meltdown was one of those where it's like, had they been able to, had they simply responded to it quicker, it would not have been as big of a disaster as it was. So in Shin Godzilla, you have a, a, a very um, incomplete Godzilla that shambles its way up onto shore in a very weakened state 
with without any defensive mechanisms whatsoever, clearly not able to breathe oxygen as well as it should be, sort of confused and destroying things mindlessly. And then you have a, a committee meeting on how to address it. And then another committee meeting to resolve an issue raised in the first committee. And then another subcommittee forms to deal with one particular aspect of how they're going to approach dealing with it. And this happens over and over. And by the time they've made any kind of a decision on how to deal with Godzilla, like he's slithered back off into the ocean. And they're like, oh, okay, well, maybe we don't have to do anything at all. And he comes back, and he's a little bit worse, and they're like, okay, well, let's have another meeting on how to deal with this. And by the time they've decided to do anything, he has stood up on his hind legs, he's grown armor plates, he's become a monster. They just wasted their time. And I love that movie. I, I love the, the main character, because he just goes from committee meeting to committee meeting, and he keeps gaining titles. Like, he keeps getting introduced in scene after scene after scene, and each time they introduce him, he has added another title onto his previous government title. <laughs> it's, it is comical in the best possible way. I love Shin Godzilla. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, Shin Godzilla is one of the most powerful gods. Shin Godzilla is a, is a monster. Shin Godzilla is exactly what I was saying. He is, he is a walking holocaust. Shin Godzilla is destruction. It's beautiful. But in that movie, they also act like they give a shit about the fact that he's destroying things, which is a nice change of pace at this point. All right, all right, all right. We just about finished up this glow effect last time, so I'm going to lay in with a little bit of orange, a touch of yellow to finish it up, and then we're going to start on the armor plates, choosing our big blocks of color, and I think that Raxus is really going to start to come together. So yeah, Godzilla vs. Kong. Um, watch it. But if you feel like just fast-forwarding through any scene that doesn't involve monster fighting, you're not going to lose much. I think that you probably already knew that, but I'm confirming it for you. You can watch it if you want, you're just going to be disappointed. The human scenes, I mean. Um, but I think all, all in all, like I would have to recommend the film. I would have to say, yeah, thumbs up, give it a watch, because the monster fighting scenes are genuinely quite entertaining and I think very clever. Insofar as two monsters fighting can be. Which, you know, if you're into that sort of thing, then you know, you know why you like it. I forget that constantly. You know what I need? I need to completely redo my desks and have one that is more uh, stable so that I can put my Vortex Mixer on my desk. As it is right now, I have to lean down to the floor to use it because if I have it on my desk, it rattles everything in my office. Just because of the way my desk is constructed. It was not constructed with a Vortex Mixer in mind. Thunderhead movie rating system. What, what could I give it? Ah, this gets four Thunderheads out of five. I give this movie one lightning bolt. Didn't expect anything except for good monster slogging. That's why I note that you can... There are parts of the movie that are going to bore you. There are parts of the movie that you will find absolutely mind-numbingly boring. They're not even just like innocuous, no big deal scenes. It's like a half an hour of characters that nobody cares about, talking about shit that nobody gives a shit about for an extended period of time and making jokes while they do it that are really eye-rollingly bad. Not in like a cute way, not in like, not in like, um... You know, there are bad jokes in like the Leslie Nielsen sense of the word. Bad jokes in the airplane Airplane 2 sense of the word, where it's like, oh, that joke was terrible, but I laughed at it. Ah, ha, ha, how silly I am. No, these are just terrible. And they won't make you laugh. If I'm watching a, a, a monster kaiju film and I'm, like, checking my phone or my Instagram, there's a problem, because I am the target demographic for this shit. That's a monpoc terrain you see on the 3D printer. It is. It is, in fact... What did you say? 8U? I'm gonna go with 8U. Yeah. I, I am printing yet more apartment buildings 
Um, this is just sort of my intro to Rain, because you only really use apartment buildings at first, and we haven't played any games of it yet, so I'm just making a bunch of them. I'm going to be painting some Monster Apocalypse. I'm looking to get started next week. Uh, that's going to be my painting in oils project. We talked a few times about painting in oils here on the stream. Well, I have finally taken the time to pre-thin all of my colors. And we're going to try some oil painting next week on some Monster Apocalypse. I didn't want to do it on more Warcaster because I've already started Warcaster and Acrylics. And I didn't want to... I did not want to mix them up. That was also Mon Pac Terrain. Oh, no, no. On... I forgot to update my command. Thank you for pointing that out, Roland. Um, you didn't see anything. There was nothing there. Nothing at all. <clears throat> I think you're going to like it. You're going to like it when I'm ready to show more of it, Roland. Like, how do you cut an ocean in half? A seesaw kind of bat? No, that's a better joke. That's a better joke than anything you're going to get out of the human characters in uh, in Godzilla vs. Kong. Yeah. No, not even... No, Romeo Void. The, the dicks on the beach joke is a much better joke. A much better joke than anything you're going to get. This is like um, a 13-year-old watched the Avengers Age of Ultron and then tried to write that script from memory. It's... It's not, it's not good. Not good at all. Mellow Minis, you have a fantastic day. Thank you so much for the raid. Thank you for stopping in. Thanks for bringing your people. I hope you have a good day, man. Mellow Minis, uh, a great painter. Very, very, very friendly. Good stream. Definitely give that guy a follow if you haven't already. Another one you need to mess with in black and white. Some Monpoc? That would be interesting. Since there have been kaiju movies in black and white, that would actually have a really, really kind of fun thematic connection, and I think you should totally do it. Like, I'm, I'm on board. Lightning bolts, thunderclaps, and storm gales. No idea what they correlate to, but those are your metrics. Eh, you can come up with something. All lightning but no thunder. I think it would be the other way around. Would it be all thunder, no lightning? Kind of like all bark, no bite. I could just make up the points arbitrarily at the end of any given review. Be like, I give this three thunder claps out of 18. Watch a lot of movies. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sorry that I watched it. I think it is worth watching at least one time. But like I said, you can comfortably skip huge portions of it, and you won't actually miss anything. Which is a little disappointing. I wish that they had. I don't even wish that they had done better human drama. Like I would take better human drama, real human drama. But. If the movie's gonna be what it is, I would prefer that they removed about a half an hour to 45 minutes of it. And just stopped pretending. And spent less money on some of the actors that they got to come in for. Like, like, uh, I don't remember which Skarsgård it even is. One of the Skarsgård boys is in the movie, and he's like, I am here. I am in this film, and I will be cashing a check later today. That's the soul, that is the sum of his contribution. It's being present. I let them write the word Skarsgård in the in the promo. <laughs> Is it Alexander? Okay, yeah, the, yeah, the tall, skinny, handsome one, not the tall, skinny, uh, spooky one, or the the one that's extra lanky. That's another one. The one who played Tarzan, which I think is probably the main reason that he got this job. Or like Tarzan, Monkey Man, King Kong. Sure, yeah, we'll do that. He, in particular, has no character at all. Like, they introduce him, and he's like, oh, I'm, 
I'm a nerdy scientist man, and they've relegated me to the basement because I talk about the Hollow Earth. And then later on in the movie, I think he actually yells. Uh, later on in the movie, he actually has a line where he's like, "Attack with all missiles!" Like <laughs> he says that he commands the the flying ships with the missile launchers. He's like, "Attack with all missiles!" I'm like, wait. Should that be your job, scientist man? Don't, is there no one on this 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 private military contractor team better suited to command the attack than you? <laughs> okay. All right. Whatever you say, Mr. Skarsgård. Yeah, right? Like, the, the character that he presents in the first scene that he's in when they introduce him has nothing to do with the character that he plays later on in the movie. And it's not like there's a growth period where he learns something in between those two scenes. He just is a different person. Which was very confusing. I, it wasn't that confusing because I already didn't care. But it was noteworthy, I suppose. And there is something that they do with the overall backstory and plot of Kong that I won't spoil it for you because I guess maybe it'll be a surprise, but it is dumb. Like, even in a universe that they've developed as quite so silly as this one is, it's particularly silly. And I'm pretty sure it just exists because they spent most of their time talking about lizard and monkey fighting. And at some point someone was like, so, I mean, Godzilla just completely wrecks Kong, right? Because that's the only thing that makes sense. And they were like, uh, you're right, we've got to give him an edge. we got to come up with something. He's got to have something that gives him a chance. And they sort of wrote a storyline around giving him one, and it doesn't make any damn sense, but it's there. We all assume the ratings will be largely arbitrary, highly personal, have an extreme floor and ceiling effect. Yeah, I wouldn't expect anything more than that from me. Uh, yeah, they're going to be very personal, very arbitrary, and change seemingly at random. Utterly meaningless at the end. Hey, what's up, Shezza Gaming? How you doing? Can we get a... Oh, yeah, we already did. We already did. They gave monkey elbow rockets, didn't they? I would have preferred that. I would have preferred... Monkey goes to the center of the earth and finds a monkey robot suit. <laughs> and then and then comes up and he's like, I am Robo Monkey. Like I, I would have enjoyed that a lot more than what actually happens. No, Daytron, though there is a scene where where Kong's dick should have been featured prominently. Where it's just, like, the context of what's happening, like, it would be unavoidable to not see Kong Schlong. And they just sort of, like, creatively edit it so it's kind of off to one side. But I'm thinking, like, every one of these characters is staring right at his dick and they can't do anything else. They have no choice. But they're just not going to show us. Okay. <laughs> uh, you can't get in big, you know, monster monkey fights. And have it dangling around. Fair enough. I mean, you know, well, I, I enjoyed I, I enjoyed the parts of the movie that are obviously what the movie was made for, which is Godzilla fighting Kong. All that was was fun. And as long as you're not hoping for anything else out of it, you'll be relatively satisfied. You just might be a little annoyed that you had to watch the other parts too. I know I was. What gets me is that people got paid millions of dollars to write that shit. It's just embarrassing for all of us. It's in the director's cut in C-17 version. <sighs> Big Chonker Lizard vs. Mecha Monkey, a Thunderhead original movie. I, If I had the money to produce that shit, I look sometimes at the people out there who just have more money than they know what to do with, so they throw it at production projects where they're just like, I want to make this movie. I'm just going to pay people until it gets made. In my fantasies, I would spend that money so much better than they do, and I know that's, that's my fantasy. So obviously in my fantasy, it's always successful. Actually, that's not true. I don't think most of the movies I would fund would be all that successful. Because I think people are stupid. 
But I'd make him. Damn right I'd make him. A Robot Jocks 2 that doesn't suck? Yeah, I'd be like, I would make... I would totally do that thing that I hate so many other directors doing, where they make a sequel 20 years after the original, and it's just a soft reboot. I would do that to Robot Jocks. It would just be called Robot Jocks, and it would chronologically be a direct sequel, but it would also sort of rewrite the whole damn thing. You know? Oh yeah, with the, an extended chainsaw crotch scene. Absolutely, freaking lootly Party bear minis. Dropping that follow. Thank you so much, my friend. Welcome to the stream, and welcome to the Storm Chasers. Party bear minis. I stopped in, uh, stopped in on your stream for CavCon. How are things, man? Hope you're having a good day. Holy moly, Yurla's studio also coming in with the follow. Welcome. I'd get Gary Graham back, dude. If he wanted to do it, I would totally. I would just. Put, I would put Gary Graham in like the. I don't remember the name of the actor. You know, the white-haired dude who was just like the the, the overall advisor to the American team. Like, yeah, I'd, he that would be his role. Are we rating this or not? How many Thunderdongs? Does Godzilla vs. Kong get? Godzilla vs. Kong gets... Two out of five chainsaw dicks. Which puts it right at... Eh, it's worth watching if you're into the subject matter. Uh, don't expect literally anything clever in the entire film. Have Achilles in the text role. See, but if I was doing this, that's the thing though, Roland. If I'm doing the soft reboot angle, then the text role still has to be. Uh, spoiler alert, the text role still has to be a traitor. But I guess in the soft reboot category, you also get points for subverting expectations. So, you know, maybe you'd make Tex not a traitor, you'd make, like, Matsumoto a traitor. I always like how Tex says Matsumoto. He says it like, Matsumoodle. Oh, Matsumoodle. He's also incredibly racist. Oh my god, he has a comment towards the end of the movie where he goes, That Jap's a bitch. I'm like, oh my god, Tex. Calm down. No. Miles Pace, Miles Pace Minis, it would not. It would not have been any better seeing it in IMAX. I don't think. But you're getting that from someone who generally doesn't like anything in IMAX. I've seen some movies that are obviously designed for it in IMAX and like, it's the most amazing visual experience in the journey. I've never really gotten that much out of it, so you know, take my recommendation on that with a grain of salt. You might have enjoyed it more in IMAX where I would not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sumitha. Yes, that's what he says. Yeah, it's a very, very racist remark from Tex right at the end of his life. Which I guess is not terribly surprising. I'll see you in hell, he says. For throwing his fat body to the bottom of a mech bay. Would you bring Athena back? You couldn't fucking pay me to bring Athena back. Oh, maybe, I mean, maybe. Here's the thing. I would, if, if Athena were to come back for a sequel to Robot Jocks that I was writing, she would need extensive rewriting. Oh, there would be so much work to do on Athena. To, to You'd have to spend uh, several scenes almost apologizing for the way that she was portrayed and treated in the first movie. out to print Avengers Tower for Mon Pac Terrain. That's a fun idea. I think Monster Apocalypse introduces a lot of really uh, fun avenues to take for miniature game terrain. I love the minis. I really, really do. I've got these built. Uh, I got Defender X from the Guard Protector Starter, and this mini is fucking cool. First of all, uh, this is from Privateer Press. Um, Privateer Press, if you're listening, which I hope you are, more of this resin. Th this, 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 this resin here pretty please, but in in Warcaster. Maybe, maybe we're just not there yet profit-wise, but pretty, pretty please. 
do some more of this. Because uh, this came together beautifully and was a joy to work with. And the model is, is so much fun. He literally has rockets attached to his arms to project his fists. And um, I love it. I really do. He was a fun build. He doesn't have that many pose options. You can do a couple little things with him. I made him kind of leaning in much more aggressively than the standard pose. And put I, I sort of rearranged his fists from where they usually go. Eh, very slightly. I love that model, though. And then uh, the other starter for the Destroyers is... I don't remember his name. It's like Gigahedron or something like that. Gorg Hadra, maybe. But this is... It's a very, very pretty model. Very pretty. I love the, the smooth... Kind of aggressive lines. The, the detail, a lot of it is put down into here in the organic portions. He's got this big saggy belly and these big, you know, organic connections. And he's got these huge armor plates. This nasty face with these really, really well sculpted eyes and teeth and everything. They're going to be easy to bring detail out on. These huge back swept shoulders with, I don't know, vents or something in the back. And then these big nasty, they're not even quite claws. They're just like grabby pads with, I, I assume they shoot like energy out of, I have no idea. He's a big monster. He does monster stuff. And then it comes with these really cool designed sort of stylized uh, tanks for the guard forces, which of course I, I magnetize. Nobody, nobody tell Cyber Knight, but I did. Just because, you know, tanks make sense. I like to be able to aim the turret at things. And then, uh, Aside from that, you have the Belchers for the, the World Destroyers faction, which, oh, look at them, they're adorable. Honestly, look at this monster and tell me it's not adorable. Or, adorable, if you will. <laughs> That's a deep cut. That's a deep cut. I like the design of this guy, though. He's supposed to be huge, like a car that a human would be in is like the size of one of these little paddle feet. So this would be gigantic and terrifying, but on this scale, he's just, oh, you're a little pudgy. Poke him in the belly. Little, -hoo -hoo -hoo. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting some paint on these. Cute fat monster. Exactly. Any recommendations on learning how to sculpt in 3D? Manro Fasal depends entirely on what you want to do, but there are some amazing tutorials on YouTube for just about any program you can dig into. Um... I do personally, uh, something people won't tell you too is sometimes it depends on how your brain works. Because like, I was very used to CAD and my brain kind of works in CAD. And Fusion 360 was a real easy transition for me. And pushing Fusion 360 to the limits of what it can do for more organic sculpting is right in line with how I like to work. Some people do better starting off in Blender and ZBrush and stuff like that. There's certainly things that those programs are better at. Um, but obviously they also cost money. Depends on, I guess, how serious you are about learning it. It's hard to not recommend Blender to some degree, because Blender's free and powerful and can do just about anything. It's just that it has a learning curve like a brick wall. It's better than it was. It's much easier to pick up now, and there are plenty of tutorials even on YouTube for how to use it, but it is a little daunting. If you don't want to spend any money and you just want to pick something up and see if you enjoy it, you can start with Blender, but just know that there are programs out there that make it a lot easier on you than Blender. Grabby patties. Ooh. You know what? I'm not gonna. You you can you can own that one, ever Ben. Even if I thought of that, I wouldn't I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> I love Blender. You know, no, I don't I don't find that surprising at all, data nerd. Blender is a fantastic piece of software. It is only painful when you're first learning to use it. Uh, I am in the unique position of having made enough money off of sculpting in three pro 3D programs that aren't Blender early enough that I could afford to jump right past Blender into ZBrush. Uh, ZBrush costs money, but holy shit, is it easy to use once you get into it. Has, it has a little bit of a learning curve. It has some idiosyncrasies to it, but it's a lot easier 
it's not even easier. You know what it is? It's more focused. And that's something you have to take into consider in consideration with Blender. Blender is designed to do everything. It's an art program. It's designed for, like, rendering. There are, there are entire animated movies on Netflix that were made in Blender and Blender alone. And it's great at doing all these different things, but as a result, you have to... I mean, with all these software, you kind of have to apply the, the 80-20, or in this case, I'd say something like... 95-5 rule, where most, in, in this case, you know, 80% of people will use 20% of the features. And in Blender, that's particularly true. You have to learn, because when you go in, it's like, look at all these buttons, look at all these panels. You have to learn that most of them are things you will never, ever use. Figure out which ones they are, and remove them from your UI as quickly as you possibly can. But it's very confusing until you do that. A lot of ZBrush is the same, but it's not quite so bad because ZBrush is, again, a very art-oriented program. It wasn't really designed with 3D printing or hard surface sculpting in mind. It just can do those things. I, for 3D printing specifically, I really, really, really like Fusion 360, and I'll tell you why. I use ZBrush for a number of things now. But I always go back to, and for that matter, start in Fusion 360 because Fusion 360 is... A design program first and foremost. It is designed to create and prototype items that should exist in the physical real world. And that's what 3D printing is. And while I imagine it's probably possible to reach the super tight tolerances that I need in my files in ZBrush, it's a lot easier to do in Fusion than it is in ZBrush. So anything that I need to be precise or mechanical, I start off in Fusion, and then I export to ZBrush, and then I do my free sculpting there. But, like, naturally, it doesn't know what you're trying to do. It, it assumes where it's like, oh, you don't, you didn't need to maintain the scale on this file, right? I can just make it whatever I want, right? And I'm like, no, ZBrush, you can't do that. Everything has to stay in scale with everything else. And it's like, sorry, bro, I was designed for, you know, artists. Not engineers, not, not designers. What's wrong with you? A couple quick touches, and I'll be done with this part, and then we can start working on his blue plates. So, unfortunately, I didn't update my STL command, so that's actually a lie, zero cool. Uh, that's what I was printing last time. What's up there right now? Those are a series of apartment buildings. There are nine of them on the plate right now for Monster Apocalypse. Usually my command is updated. Sometimes I forget that I forgot. That's exactly it to square. Uh, yeah, fusion is all is all parametric. And for that matter, if you're doing smooth and curved surfaces that you can define using simple mathematics, fusion is going to give you STLs with much smoother curved surfaces because it is describing those surfaces using a mathematical equation as opposed to Blender or Fusion which are going to generally describe those same surfaces in a triangular mesh and that's when you do things like I made a cylinder and the cylinder comes out with faceted blocks on the sides of it it's because it's describing that cylinder as a as a mesh whereas Fusion is describing it as a mathematical equation so it's perfectly round recommend a good starter 3D resin printer. Um, the Mars 2. The Elegoo Mars 2 is is a fantastic, uh, absolutely fantastic machine. I would get the Mars 2 over the Mars 1 at this point just because it, it's basically a complete replacement for the Mars 1. I have the Mars version 1. I'm still using it. I like it very much. My next upgrade is the Mars 2. Don't get the Mars 2 Pro, honestly. Like Unless you've just got money to throw at it and you're like, I want a couple little extra features. I think it's overpriced for what it is. Um... What are my thoughts on 3D printing models and terrain with PLA like the Enders? That's I do most of my printing on Enders. Zero cool. That up there is an Ender 3 V1 that is printing there with my Frankenstein head on it. Above that, I have an Ender 3 V2. I've had more problems with the V2 than I've had with the V1. I don't have a real explanation for why that is. Mechanically, it doesn't make any sense to me, but it's just... Uh, 
Empirically speaking, problems have cropped up on the V2 more often than they have on the other one. I recommend if you're playing games. See, every, every suggestion depends on what are you doing with your printer. If you're playing, like, tabletop war games, that's your primary interest, right? I think that an, something like an Ender or an Elegoo Neptune 2, an FDM printer, is going to be more useful to you generally than a resin printer. You can do some minis on it. They're not going to be the best, but you can do some minis on it. And you can and should do all of your terrain on an FDM printer. It is fucking amazing for that purpose. PLA terrain is durable. It is, uh, it can, it can have lots of little neat mechanical features. I just, I like everything about printing in PLA. Resin is much more specialized. It, if you're printing actual miniatures, and that's most of what you're going to do, like you're looking to print figures that you're then going to paint, you want them to look really good and highly detailed, you want a resin printer then. Absolutely. Ultimately, if you're doing this for wargaming, you're eventually going to want to own one of each. Kind of at a minimum. You should be expecting, if you want to get one of each, to invest overall five to $600 in the process. But, if you wargame regularly, if you do a little bit of maths, you should quickly find out that you're spending a lot more than that every year anyway. And if you run these printers for a year and are careful about printing stuff rather than buying it, it's going to pay for itself in money that you're not otherwise spending fairly quickly. Try to print minis on my under 5, really can't get great results, supports are often too much and destroy the model. Zero, cool. Are you familiar with support interfacing? If you are not, you should investigate support interfacing in Cura. What it will do is create a flat surface between the supports and the model itself that can be quickly and easily peeled away so that your supports come off in a big chunk as opposed to lots and lots of little pieces. That has helped me immensely with printing detailed things on the Ender or things that need lots of supports. Minis with my under three, you can get good results with some fine tuning, but won't be as good as resin. Yeah, that that, that kind of breaks it down, Rangonius. Like you can print minis in FDM. They're never gonna be as precise as they will on the resin. They just won't be. It's not physically possible. But with some tuning and some practice, you can get ones that are acceptable. And it depends on why you're printing them. If you're just like, I wanna make a bunch of minis that look okay so I can play a game with them, it's fine. If you're making terrain, definitely FDM. I do not recommend. Uh, resin for terrain. Um, you can do it! Like, there are definitely people out there who print whole terrain pieces in resin. I just think that the the headache of doing it and the extra work that you have to do to get it done and the, the, the warp factors and things like that kind of aren't worth it. Um, people tend to think about, like, uh, it's in Cura. You're looking for the support interfacing setting in Cura Zero Cool. <sighs> people talk about the print lines on FDM printing like the, oh, it ruined the terrain, it looks like shit now. There are ways to work around that that I think a lot of people don't utilize. And furthermore, does it really bother you that much? Little print lines? Like, you can, even if all you do is print at a really, really low, uh, really, really high, rather, resolution, and then hit the thing with some filler primer to fill in the gaps, like, it really doesn't look that bad. 
It really, just for what you're getting, for how durable it is, for how cheap it can be, like, it's something that I got over very, very quickly. And furthermore, if designers are smart, and they're designing knowing that their work is going to be printed in FDM, there are things that they can do, features that they can include, that make that problem less of a problem. That is, that is something that I do in all of my files, is I design with printing in mind, and I implement some small features that just lessen the impact of the printing process on the final piece. This is something I think we're going to see more of in the next year. This last year saw a lot of people who formerly worked in 3D sculpture and design and art moving over into 3D printing because their skill set seemed very applicable. They were like, oh, well, shit, I can, I can make models of cool-looking stuff and people will pay me for them so they can 3D print them? Sure. But they didn't know how to design for 3D printing, so you wind up with a lot of files that maybe don't print the best, even though they look really good in renders. I think that's changing. I think that a lot of people have learned a lot over the last year, and you're going to see more and more files designed with printers in mind. I didn't say that, Kursala. You said that. It's a lot that looks strange in renders, but print very well. That is... yes. That is exactly what I'm talking about. There are people who make... who work for the render, and the render looks amazing, but it doesn't print very well. And then there are people that work for the print and accept that the render might look a little goofy, particularly if you're working at smaller scales. But that's why a lot of those artists, the 3D artists transitioning over into making 3D printer Patreons and Kickstarters, tended to work in larger scales because their work looked better then. But well, we'll see some changes, I'm fairly confident. very interested to see where the trend of the 3D printer Patreon Kickstarter goes in the next year, because it's been the wild fucking west. And now we got big companies getting in on it, doing their own Kickstarters for files and stuff. I mean, I think that the future of wargaming lay in 3D printing. I think that eventually we're going to see a really good release, a really large release of games that are entirely 3D printed. Um, Rick Graham over at White Light Media has sort of embraced that with his game uh, Revelation Skirmish. Which is good. It's an excellent game, and you should check it out. But uh, the business model isn't clear yet. Like, there's a business model in there somewhere that's going to be the next big thing, the next huge step in wargaming that's going to revolutionize the industry. We don't know what it is yet, but people are experimenting, trying to find it. What am I using to hold my mini right now? This is a uh, Rathcore miniature holder that I got from a Kickstarter, oh, years ago, Dark Heart. I use it for certain minis, depending on how much time I plan to spend time. How much? Oh, that wasn't a good sense. Depending on how much time I plan to spend on them, or how they're shaped, or how heavy they are, I like this one for tall minis that I want to do detail work on because it has this tall bar here that I can sort of apply pressure to and get fairly precise with. Yeah, to square. Uh, that is for me, too. It's the obsessive part of my brain that looks at the print lines and goes, that's a problem. It's the same part of my brain that used to make me do just idiotic crap. Like, I have to paint every detail of the chest eagle on this space marine, even though I'm then going to glue a bolter over the front of it, and literally no one is ever going to be able to see it again. Ever since I embraced a more relaxed painting philosophy, I've been happier and my work has been better. Quite simply, if it's if you can't reach it with a brush, nobody's going to be able to see it, so what are you painting it for? If it's that hard to reach, make it a shadow. Obviously, we all paint for our own reasons, and maybe that's important to you, and you should let no one stop you from pursuing your obsessive level of detail if that's what you really want to do. But don't. Don't do it because you think you have to. You definitively do not. And no one will ever fucking notice. I know. I know someone's already typing into their keyboard. Yeah, but I'll notice. Yeah, I know. 
said the same thing. My advice is not necessarily for everyone. This is an art forum, folks. And ultimately, you have to decide the level of detail that you're comfortable with and ask yourself why you're painting minis. Maybe you're painting minis because you love painting and each one is its own little piece of art. If that's the sole reason and you want to do every little detail, do it. Because that's what you're doing. I like to do some of that. But a lot of the time, I'm just I'm painting game pieces. I'm painting these pieces because I want to play the game. And if I'm going to be doing that, I can't obsess over every little thing. I can just try to get faster at the things that, that pay off the most. the underside there of that mini where it's gray. Yeah, like, back there? I'm not gonna paint that shit. <laughs> Nobody's ever gonna see that. My life for ire. Hey, what's up, Mina? How you doing? Here at Thunderhead Studio, we specialize in turning your shame into... <laughs> more shame. It's true. Alright. Now, to start with some other colors. How about that? Painting for 32 years? No. <laughs> no. Um, you have to, I have to kind of break it down into uh, into chunks, Dark Heart. There's guys like Gus Schultz here who has been painting for the last uh, 72 years straight and hasn't stopped even one time. That might be inaccurate, but you wouldn't you wouldn't know it based on seeing his work. Um, Am I 3D printing minis? Mean I'm always 3D printing minis. In this case, I'm 3D printing some apartment buildings for a game called Monster Apocalypse. You can't see it, but that's just one of the several 3D printers that I have running in my office at any given time. How long have I been painting? It's a good question. It's a good question. Mina, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome. Welcome to the stream and welcome to the Storm Chasers. I think I discovered Warhammer... I discovered Tabletop... Well, let's take it back to the beginning. I discovered miniatures when I was probably seven or eight years old. Through a game that you're probably familiar with called Hero Quest. And then a series of subsequent games like Crossbows and Catapults, and um, The Dark World, and, and a few others like that. That's how I discovered minis. I didn't know that painting minis was a thing yet. I then proceeded to play... Magic the Gathering for years and years and years after that and just be a general dork. I discovered painting miniatures probably when I was about 13? I think, I think I was 13. On one of the trips that I took to Europe where I went to uh, Sterling in the UK and I wandered into a store that said Games Workshop over the top, and I was like, what could this possibly be? And um, there were some gentlemen in there who I've told this story many times over the years, and I'm always like, oh, there's, you know, these like big, fat, bearded guys wearing glasses, being huge nerds who had painted all these models, and they were like, hey, come check out this game. I realize now as I describe them, I'm just describing myself. So, you know, take from that what you will. And I was like, oh, that's really, really cool. I don't think I started painting minis until a few years later when I was 15 when I finally got some of my local friends. It, it would have been around the time that Dawn of War came out, the first Dawn of War Warhammer 40k game. Fantastic game. Speaking of which, I wanted to mention that today because we should play some of that. I saw Chaotic Harmony playing Dawn of War 1 on his stream just yesterday and I'm so fucking here for that. I want to get down on some of that business. part am I doing in blue, I wonder? I'm going to leave that gray, so this part's going to be in blue. I want to play some of that, though. Anyway, 
Dawn of War came out, my friends learned about Warhammer for the first time, and I was the one who at that point got to be like, did you know that there is a tabletop game with miniatures you could be playing based on this? And they went, whoa, 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 whoa. And that started a whole thing. Some friends of mine bought Tyranids, I picked up some Black Templar Space Marines, another friend bought Chaos, and we went from there, and it was... Those early attempts were bad. I had no idea what I was doing. We were all making it up. They were... Ooh, that was rough. But it was fun. We had a good time with it. And then I stopped because, you know, our friend group kind of moved on, and um, I picked it back up again when I was... 19, because I just joined the army, and as it turns out, in the military, in the army, there are a lot of fucking people that play Warhammer 40k, and there are game stores around a lot of military bases, so I had the chance to get into it again, so I picked up some Space Marines, and that would have been around the time 4th edition was on, and 5th edition came out during that stretch, because I got the 5th edition limited edition codex, I still have it. They only made like 4,000 of them, and it's worth, like, not a lot of money now. I think at the time I told myself, like, it's going to be worth money one day. It isn't. And then there would have been another gap in there, because that would have been for a couple of years. And those are, I, ha I have minis that I painted in that, that spate. When I'm like, I want to show off my first painted mini. I'm showing minis from that region of my painting history. Where is he? This would be one of the first minis that I did from that particular era of painting, this this Space Marine guy here, because this kit was new at the time. And I remember I cut the shit out of my finger making this, this bolter that I just sort of smashed together. Oh, it's ugly. But yeah, I bled into that real bad. I had just learned how to drill barrels, and so they're all, like, horrifically uneven and really shitty looking. I was also really pleased with myself because I had just learned what green stuff was, and I used green stuff to make the greaves for this guy's leg. This was for a project that were called, at the time, um, Doghouse? Was that the name of the guy? There was a dude on Bolter and Chainsword. His name was Doghouse, or Hound something, I can't remember what it was. But he had figured out that if you, if you took Warhammer Fantasy Chaos warrior legs and sculpted power boots onto them, you could do these sort of gothic-looking, what we call true-scale space marines, because this made them taller than the regular space marines. This was long before Primaris. And I cobbled this guy together out of random parts. I made my own little tech marine. Man, this was a long time ago. And then there was, after that, there was a period of uh, another number of years where I wasn't painting anything, and then I got back into it, and I have been painting now in this latest stretch, as I, I near the end of this incredibly drawn out and probably uninteresting story. Um, when would that have been? Six years? Kind of without stopping now? That seems about right. And I would say that most of what skill I have in painting was developed in that six year period, because everything prior to that was pretty rough. Because I picked it back up for, uh, I think the game that got me going again was a friend of mine picked up some Warhammer for, no, you know what it was? It was, it was X-Wing. I picked up X-Wing and I got a friend of mine into it and then he dragged me back into 40k because he discovered it then and he was like, oh shit, we gotta play some of this game, it looks awesome. I was like, alright, we'll get back into it, fine, I've done it before, but yeah, sure, let's do it. And I haven't stopped since then. <laughs> not much that not 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 that much could have changed, Hathrier. If pics you took while on base, hell yeah. I love seeing old pictures. It's 
It's important to remember where we've been so that we can understand where we are. And I encourage everyone to take pictures of of your old minis. If you still have the first minis that you painted unchanged, take pictures of them now. You can always lose the minis, but it'll be nice to have digital records of what you've done. Take some good pictures, because you're going to want to look back on them later. You're thinking now, like, I'll never want to look at this. When I paint better than this, I'll never want to look at you, Will. You will absolutely want to see. If you keep going for a few years, you'll be like, well, what about that first mini I painted? What happened there? Not necessarily bad, just, you know, inexperienced. There are people in this world who are artistic prodigies. There are people in this world who seem to just be like, Hey guys, this is my first mini ever and it looks amazing. I would caution you against believing those stories every time. Sometimes they're true. But I'd caution you against believing those stories, because particularly like on Reddit, people will post, oh, Hey guys, I just started painting minis last month. What do you think of the Space Marine that I did? And it looks just incredible. And the statement, the initial statement, I haven't painted minis before, should have a little asterisk with it, because usually when you get the whole story, it's like, oh, well, you know, I am a traditionally paint-trained oil artist who has been painting on canvas for the last 15 years. And you're like, oh, I see. Okay, gotcha, you karma farming piece of shit. First paint, what a load of shit. But there are definitely people out there who just pick up a brush and go and they do amazing work. Those people are few and far between. Those people are uh, not to be compared to because most human beings are not that. Most human beings have to work to become any good at art at all. To take what's in your brain, those vivid imaginings that you have, and to translate them into physical reality takes practice. That's what I'm doing. I'm not even all that good at it. Yeah, I, I, I count Iberben in that. Iberben's like, oh, I don't know how to paint, you guys. Oh, I'm colorblind, so I have no idea what paint I'm using. How is my latest mech? And it's like a piece of fucking artwork. And you're like, okay. Okay. Whatever you say, buddy. But Darkheart, something I try to encourage around here, and I know that I slip sometimes and I do it myself, but it is something that I try to encourage and I try to remember. Don't say bad things about your own work. I don't care. I don't I don't care if even if they're true. Because you can and should be your own cheerleader. You can afford to believe in your own work, even when other people don't. And I say this because the world is a bitch. The world is an absolute bastard, and it will tear you down every chance that it gets. It will never build you up unprompted. You have to, on some level, be your own cheerleader. I'm not saying don't recognize when you need improvement. I'm not saying don't take advice. But don't say bad things about your own work. I understand the tendency to be kind of self-effacing. To say things like, I could never paint as good as you paint, Mr. Professional Painter Man. But here's the thing, you can. You absolutely fucking lootly can. It just takes practice. See the good in your own work. Enjoy it. Don't compare your work to other people's. The only person whose work you should be comparing yours to is yourself from yesterday. That's only if you want to. Do you want to do better? Do you want to improve? Then compare your work to your old work. But don't compare it to other people's work. Get inspired by other people's work. See things that you like that they did. Try to figure out how they did them and try them yourself. But don't let it discourage you. And I can say that right now, like that's even harder to do than it was when I got started painting. Because when I got started painting, the internet was not what it is now. Social media definitely wasn't. 
And social media can really kill your desire to paint if you let it. If you let it. That's what I'm saying. Don't let it. Paint for the joy of it. It's not a competition. Exactly, Mannix. If you're not willing to be your own cheerleader, nobody out there is going to do it for you. You have to be willing to like your own work and to enjoy doing it. It sounds so simple, but it's actually surprisingly difficult to do for a lot of people, myself included. got too thinned out. I don't know why. As human beings, we're already our own worst critic, and I use that phrase very specifically and for a reason. I don't say you're your own harshest critic. It's true, but that's not my point. You are your own worst critic. Which is to say that, quite ironically, in many ways, you are the least qualified to really criticize your own work because you are personally tied up in it. Because you can paint something amazing and present it to the world, and the world can say this looks amazing, and yet when you look at it, you're still seeing every little mistake that you made. You're seeing every little brush stroke. Because you remember doing it. Because you know the parts of it that you didn't mean to do and the parts that you did mean to do. And when someone says, wow, that thing you did there is amazing, you have the thought in your head of, oh shit, I didn't mean to do that. And you can turn that around into negative critique. And what you should be doing is asking yourself, how can I do more of that? Accept praise, too. Someone says you did a good job, take it. Don't go out of your way to break yourself down or pretend like you didn't mean to do it or be like, oh, I don't deserve it. You do. Just let them say the nice things. It's okay. It's not going to hurt anybody. And I know, I know, I know, I violate these rules a lot myself. That's what some people in chat are thinking right now. The people who are here regularly, they're like, yeah, he's full of shit. He always talks crap about his own work. And you're right, I do. But I don't pretend that it's healthy. And I do try to stop it. But all this comes back around to our rule here. You're not allowed to talk shit about your own work. Welcome, everyone, oh to God. Thunderhead Studios, where the only rule is... This is the other rule. Please don't show me your genitals. This is an important Have rule, Have fun, too. be safe, and above all... Don't show them to me, for the love of God. I don't encourage you to forget that rule while pursuing the other one. All rules have their place. Oof, I'm tired today. Kinda low energy. Going to get my second COVID shot tomorrow, though. That's gonna be that's gonna be a good time. Regular vaccination party. Oh, thank you, Iberben. You clipped something inspiring. That's a nice change of pace for you, you fucking troll. Exactly, Mannix. You can afford to accept it, even if you don't necessarily... Here's the thing, and the reason that I say this is because the human mind is a funny thing. And you might think to yourself that humility is, is 
is a virtue and that being humble is good for you and being like, oh, it's not that big a deal or my work isn't as good as yours, you may think that these things are healthy. But like I said, the human mind is a funny thing. And if you say something enough times, it can become true. Not in actuality, but in your mind. And what else really matters? And if you go around all day saying to people, Hey, my name's such and such and I'm an idiot. It might be funny. It might get you some laughs. People might chuckle at it. But the scary thing is that if you say it enough times, you're going to start to believe it. And then you're not making a joke anymore. Then you're just depressed and you're calling yourself an idiot. And you think you're an idiot. People do this all the time. You can convince yourself of some truly crazy things. So when you say things like, I can never paint like this guy, a little bit at a time, slowly, day by day, you're making it true. Don't do that to yourself. Had some really oddball criticism. Too bad you don't deal real models. <laughs> this stuff is so amazing. Just imagine what kind of work you can do if you get stoned. Even as as someone who uh, smokes a lot of weed, <laughs> which I am, um, I don't like I don't I don't like getting stoned and doing art. I know that there are people out there who are like it makes me creatively so much more open, and that's great for them. But it just makes me hungry and kind of lazy. <laughs> I don't get anything done. So I stay sober for my painting. Save my inebriation for watching fucking Godzilla vs. Kong. Where it belongs. It's legal here, Riot Sister. I discovered uh, a little while ago that if it's legal where you are, you can actually do it on Twitch. I could toke up right here, right now, and it would be perfectly fine. If the feds are interested in coming after me, like, they'll find something, man. Me not mentioning weed on Twitch is not going to stop them. Yeah, I, I found this out after I was watching a streamer who was just like, Hey, I'm gonna smoke some weed real quick. And they busted out a pipe and a bowl and just lit up on stream. And I was like, wait, what? Excuse me? And yeah, it turns out that uh, you're, you're totally fine doing that as long as it's legal where you're at. Which is kind of cool. Makes sense. People can drink on stream. more dark areas do I really want on this model, I wonder. I feel like that might be good enough. Nope, I can see one more spot. Just to balance out his little center chest arc reactor thing he's got going on here. Looks like you got Cheeto crumbs on your right thumb. No, it's orange paint. He's crusted acrylic orange paint from when I was opening my orange paint bottle. Do I seem like the kind of man who would eat Cheetos to you? Probably.
there's a stereotype about the kind of person who eats Cheetos, I assume I'd just fall right into it. No, actually. Oh! What would you assume my snack of choice is, Riot Sister? Harold and Kumar, but Thunderhead and Katakarman. Oh. <laughs> oh, that would actually be fun. <laughs> Fucking Katakarmony and Thunderhead go to Whataburger. I would be so into that. <laughs> mm. Wishy washy with painting while high. Sometimes I do fine, sometimes I don't. Yeah, solid line. I just, you know, I, I, I do better when my brain is clearer. I prefer it for other, other tasks. Thin down some of my dark warm gray to work in a couple of deeper shadows and then start highlighting up from there. Ah, yes. Fruits by the feet. That's accurate. But then you've seen that, so I don't think that counts as a guess. Have I shown you guys the dueling dragon? Did I ever get around to that? Did I have any fruits by the feet? To show you how to how to do that particular trick? It involves eating two fruits by the feet simultaneously. You know, interestingly, White Wolf, I'm not. I don't like gushers. I'm really kind of not into them. Yeah, I don't want feet anywhere near my fruit, Drakari. But I do want my fruit by the feet. Thinning out a little bit of Reaper Gray liner here. parts here. Doesn't need much, but it feels silly not doing it, so. Alright. Start doing a little bit of edge highlighting. I think I'm going to start using scale 75 birch. Next time I have some fruits by the feet, I'll have to show you the Dueling Dragon's method of eating them. It is a carefully tested and designed technique that I started working on when I was in third grade. And it has, it has been more or less perfected at this point. That's going to that's gonna wind up being a subscribers only stream. I don't just give away my secrets. Except when I do, which is most or all of the time. What's everybody up to today? What are you uh, what are you what are you working on out there in Twitchverse? What are you painting? Those of you who are painting things. Oops. That's okay, I'm gonna re 
repaint that part, I don't care. Blender. Godspeed, Gray Fox. I really do find that program infuriating, but I have immense respect for people who can get work done in it. Tempting to paint a squad of Marines? I would say you are painting a squad of Marines. Why attempt when you can do? value is in the attempt, ultimately. Something, something, Yoda, something. Speaking of which, Darkheart, I got some, uh, I got some paints pulled out for you that I'm gonna try to get on their way to you here shortly as part of our, uh, Thunderheads Home for Wayward Paints program. I was waiting on a couple of tools to come in because I wanted to send you a Game Envy brush. It is still on its way, but it's taking forever, so I'm going to slip in one of my unused ones that I got as part of my initial run. Got my big miniature market order. Thoroughly disappointed out of nine boxes ordered. Two of them had mechs you genuinely need. You got seven or eight minis. Oh, you mean um, you got like the, the the salvage boxes? This is the ultimate downfall of the blind booster when it comes to minis. Like, I really just, just give me the goddamn mini that I want. Don't send me plastic I don't want. Why are we listening to Mega Man music? Because we're broadening our horizons. Nothing since finishing Adeptus Mechanicus. Would you, uh, which one did you finish last, Romeo Void? Samurai-inspired Merc model for Legion of Everblight? Oh, nice, Hathrier. I like Legion's models. They're very cool. When I did briefly play War Machine, I played Legion of Everblight. You know, War Ma Hordes, I guess. That's a Hordes faction. This music I am actually going to skip because it is terrible. Just puts a headset back on and heard your name. Oh no, I was summoning you like Beetlejuice. I was all like, Romeo Void, Romeo Void, Romeo Void. That's all that was happening. I think I was asking which uh, Mechanicus figure you finished last. I can't recall. Sister, thank you for the periodic reminder. Oh, oh, have a little bit of water. First to three steps finished for the small energy guys. You're kind of wishing you sprung for the CR6 Max. You could build the entire thing at once. You know, I can see that. There's always a risk, though. 
There's always a risk in printing lots of things at once on a single FDM print. Wait, is the CR6? That's not the... The belt assembly line one, is it? That one just has a larger build area. I like to run my prints one at a time. Because you don't actually, on an FDM printer, you're not saving any time by running multiple prints. It just extends the time that you're going to be printing. The more that you put on the plate. And the more that you have on the plate, the greater your chances of a failure are. I say that as I have nine of the same model on one plate. I understand that. I understand that. The sort of inherent irony in my, my claim. But I needed nine of them, and... Uh, so far, I've had numerous successful single prints of it, so I wasn't terribly concerned. It's a very simple model. I've always got an excuse. About 5mm larger in XYZ. Okay. Yeah, I thought the CR6 was the one. It was more, like, designed just to be newbie-friendly. It had, like, the handle on it, a bunch of other extra snazzy features. That's what I thought. I can't remember the name of the assembly line one, though. That is a neat idea. It's not an assembly line. It's just... It's got a, a belt for the plate. So you can print like a whole lot of small pieces. Just say, hey, make like 30 of these, and it'll kind of roll them off. Don't have a picture, trying to find it online, but not there. Hmm. Oh, I'm extra curious. Gosh, I'm tired today. I don't even know why. Just like. Augie. Slept decently last night. Got up and out early. Ran some errands. Eat some tacos. And right now my body is just like, yeah, you need a nice long nap, right? You'll just fall asleep immediately after the stream is over. That seems like a good idea. As I say it out loud, I feel like, yes, that is a good idea. That is something I should do. Maybe I need a glass of refreshing Coca-Cola. I don't know if sugar would help me right now. I mean, it might. I don't know. Gamers, 14 months of subscribing. How you doing, We're the Gamers? I want to apologize. We did not get as much of a focus on Greg the Salt Miner slash We're the Gamers uh, monthly challenge this month as we have in previous ones. I've just been occupied with other things that haven't been uh, super conducive to the black and white challenge, despite it being a very cool one. But I love your monthly challenges, Weird Gamers. I think they're a really fucking good idea and a really good way to keep us all kind of engaged and working on new stuff. And I think I mentioned this to you earlier. I'd like to find a way for us to integrate them on a more regular basis. So that we can all sort of participate and then have a monthly roundup at the end of every challenge like we did for the first couple there. I think this is going to become more of a permanent feature if you are up for continuing to challenge us to try new things. Who's ready for the... Oh, yeah, that's what I was just talking about. I didn't even read it, and I was just talking about exactly the same thing. I'm definitely ready for the next one. Curious to find out what it's gonna be. 
For those of you who have participated in this last month black and white challenge, I think we're going to do a roundup probably on our next stream. Which may or may not be this upcoming Sunday. It may or may not be. I say it may not be because I am getting my second COVID shot tomorrow. And while I will probably be fine by Sunday, it seems like everybody has a different reaction to it. And some people have spent two to three days just on their ass after the second one. So that's going to be kind of a wait and see how I feel that morning before a decision is made. Sunday Easter, is it? I don't fucking know. I'm not... Do, do I look religious? Huh. I, don't, I don't celebrate Easter. Hey, 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 Wandering XP. Welcome in. How you doing, man? Get a, uh, get a shout-out. A shout-out from my man, Wandering XP. There it is, Riot Sister. On the fucking ball. How you doing? How are things, Wandering XP? Good to see you. You can, if there's one thing you can rely on from me, guys, here at this stream, is that I will completely disregard religious holidays. I really don't care. So what's the blob suspended over the model? Uh, it's, it's like this little funny cartoon skull. Whoa! Whoa, guys! How did I get up here? Uh, that's just, uh, it links together the two wire ends here because you can peel this open and remove it from the handle and put on a smaller one. But the intent of it is just to provide a little nub at the end of the handle so that you can grip it properly. Probably not very well, Ion Raptor, considering uh, Twitch Mobile sucks. But I'm glad to have you here anyway. It's going well, Wandering XP. Thank you for asking. And thank you for getting that shout-out done, Riot Sister. How you doing, uh... Acrostor. I'm gonna I'm gonna struggle with that name a few times and I apologize. <laughs> Just every time I look at it, my brain does something different with it, and I don't know why. It's not like you have a particularly complex or crazy screen name. It's just my brain struggles with it. Stupid brain. If you don't respect the cat, you're gonna get the bat. It's true. I won't be able to stop her either. Got it in one. Hell yeah! What are you working on today, Acrostore? And, uh, guys, for those of you who have come in from the Warcaster community, um, there has been an incredibly uh, welcoming response to the files that I have made available. And uh, thank you, guys. Because I'm, I'm very, very new to Warcaster. I mean, everybody's kind of new to Warcaster. It's a new game. But I'm, I'm newer to Warcaster than many people are. Lord Hethrier got me started on it. And I've been having a lot of fun working my figures up figuring out my color schemes, and uh, anytime I start a new game, I go a little wild with terrain design, so I made a bunch of things that I intend to use myself, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited that everybody else seems to like it pretty well. And if you're printing some of my stuff, I always love to see finished printed pictures. If you have any questions, always feel free to contact me on Discord or on Facebook. I'm, I'm generally happy to answer questions. I apologize, I am kind of low energy today, but I'm just, oh, for whatever reason, very sleepy. So 
Still trying to decide on a color scheme for your marcher worlds. That is the trick, isn't it? I'm veering more towards, like, studio schemes these days. I don't know if it's just me getting lazy or, or what. Phase 3D printing days. Don't paint much except on weekends. Day 5 of printed small energy geyser. Lost two days of progress to the discount. Yeah, that... I, I, I generally don't recommend people uh, use direct connections to printers. For whatever reason, there are a lot of failures. A lot of failures when people do that. The, the SD card is uh, a perfectly viable avenue for trans transferring files to your printer. Particularly for long prints. For short prints, it might not be as much of an issue. Just like it times out or something, I don't know. I did it like one time, I had my own problems, and since then I've been all SD cards. Loading this D for now. Should we try a long print over Pi later? I know people make it work. HBO Max looks like a good investment for streaming service. Yeah, that was one thing that I said after watching Godzilla vs. Kong last night. I said very distinctly. However I feel about the movie, however much, uh, however much I might recommend it or not recommend it, one thing is for sure. If HBO Max continues to bring me movies right to my couch, I will pay their monthly fee. And that's what they... That, that, this is the interesting thing about making movies for the streaming era as opposed to movies for the everybody goes to the theater era, is they're not chasing those one-time purchases anymore. What they're chasing are uh, monthly subscriptions. They're chasing, okay, but is this worth me paying you $15 a month for the rest of my life? And so far, the answer is yes. It also lets them do better shows. Which is kind of interesting. Though it also seems to encourage a lot of streaming providers to go for, like, the heavy cliffhangers and shit, because they're really just trying to keep you strung along from month to month, and that I don't like so much. water on my glove and I keep swiping through it like an idiot. There we go. Binge the first two Beverly Hills Cops. Well, that just makes it all worthwhile right there, doesn't it? Thinking of canceling Netflix for HBO Max. Whew, that's a big jump. But Netflix has lost a lot of good stuff lately. Hey, Amateur Pain Hour. How are you doing today? Could we get a shout-out? Pretty, pretty please for Amateur Pain Hour. Another excellent painter and streamer right here on Twitch. Twitch has a pretty amazing painting community, I gotta say. I've got to say, some of the some of the best painters in the world, and I think getting to interact with people while they work and while they hobby is one of the neatest features about streaming. I never really got streaming until I started watching paint streamers. I, I admit I watch more um, like game streamers these days than I ever used to before, because what I used to before was none. I think I understand it now more than I did, but I didn't. A grasp it at all 
prior to the first time someone pointed out that some of my favorite painters also sat around and bullshitted while they painted live on stream. And I'm like, that's actually pretty cool. Maybe we'll give it a shot. Maybe I should give the streaming thing a shot, you guys. Do you think so? Do you think anyone would show up to watch if I streamed? Because so far, this is all just an extended fantasy I've been having. Sort of talking to people in my head. Imagining what it would be like. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that's what's been going on. <laughs> I just know how embarrassed I would be if I found out that I've actually been streaming this whole time. Painting up some Kellhounds, prepping to mail out the first models you've ever sold. Hell yeah, at your paint hour. Congratulations. Forgot how funny Eddie Murphy is. Definitely depends on the, the movie and the era. But yes, in the, generally speaking, Eddie Murphy is fucking hilarious. Has been. Has been fucking hilarious. I was not a big fan of coming to America with the two in the middle of it. But then it also had a moment in the middle of the movie where it sort of acknowledged how pointless it was, and I can't be angry at it after that. I'm like, okay, well, at least you know. At least you know there's no good reason for this to be happening, Eddie. That's something. Wandering XP, you lurk away, my friend. I love my lurkers. I've come to understand the act of lurking on Twitch. I do plenty of it myself. Makes more sense out of the view numbers a lot of the time. Unless it's wandering XP. I don't leave him alone when he's lurking. Him I like to call out and put on the spot as much as I can. I really am kind of sleepy today, guys, and I'm sorry that my, my energy level is lower than it normally is. that before, Roland, but I can't remember who it was. The Beverly Hills Cop was written for another comedian. Oh, I agree with that, Roland. Yeah, Wesley Snipes was fucking funny. Wesley Snipes was funny in the Coming to America sequel. He was ridiculous. He was like a, like a TikTok warlord. <laughs> so hip. So fresh. Written for Richard Pryor? Oh yeah, that would have been a very different film, I feel like. I do feel like I've heard that before, though I can't remember where, and obviously I couldn't remember that it was Richard Pryor until you told me. Mostly on this step, I'm just kind of lightly highlighting some edges, but mostly cleaning up the messy work from the initial glow effects and such. Like, 
up here where the white got completely covered. Don't care much for snipes at the very least in the past it didn't seem to get comedy at least when filming blade 3 ryan reynolds line about he hates me doesn't he was an ad lib and actually yeah i wouldn't i think that ryan reynolds and wesley snipes are obviously very very different actors he's he's come a long way since you know going to prison <laughs> oh greg yes all the time ever fall into the trap of continuing to work on a 3d file that's actively on your printer getting test printed uh, yeah, I the, the number of times I've test printed things and before it's done, I'm like, I have the next iteration. I want to test print. It's uh, silly. I'm, I'm not I'm terrible at time management. Just in general, I'm not, not not good at it. It's not a skill I ever really developed very well. Whether that manifests as being bad with uh, deadlines or as uh working way too much on individual projects at inappropriate times because I just can't help myself manifest in a number of ways but it's all the same problem That's probably true. I, I don't really know. I haven't really seen a lot of interviews about working with Ryan Reynolds. Um, but that does seem to very much just be kind of like who he is as, as a person, as a human being. And that's probably quite a lot to deal with. See, at the same time, though, I hear that there were, like, a lot of, not necessarily ad-libbed, but actor-inserted lines that they went with for movies like Blade 1. Like, his whole little, motherfucker, you out of your damn mind when they shoot him in the beginning, which is really funny. And then that one line that he wrote during one of their meetings, which was inserted at the end of the movie, that doesn't seem to have to do with, like, literally anything, but it's just so classic. Before he kills Deacon Frost, and he's like... Some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate uphill. I've heard that too, Orcus, that yeah, when they were filming Blade, it was just like, well, Blade's on the set, he just became the guy. the characters to method act for you choose a half vampire half vampire hunter okay yeah sure whatever you say mr. snipes Of. I have work in 30 minutes, so export whatever I have so I can print while I'm at work. Yeah, I'm always trying to utilize the times when I can't be working on stuff to have my printers just going, 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 going. Always printing something.
Blade was a cool movie. I feel like it's a pretty uh, uncontroversial statement. There aren't many people that would disagree with that. Blade was a lot of fun. I was not as into Blade 2 when it came out, but over time I came to appreciate it more. I still don't think it's as good as Blade 1, but it's, it's, it's just a very different film. And of course, now I'm a bigger fan of the artistic flair that Guillermo del Toro brings to a project, and I recognize the Guillermo-y bits that made their way into Blade 2. Guillermo just, he, he, he wants to do what he wants to do. He wants to do very, very particular things. And when he steps in to do, like, a sequel to a pre-existing movie or franchise, it can come off as odd, because it's like when you're having a conversation with someone and they're spending the whole time thinking about what they're going to say next. <laughs> like, he wanted to do his own thing, and if there was something conflicting with that in Blade, he was like, that's fine, we can undo that. Which a lot of people don't like. trouble getting this scale 75 to thin to just the point that I want it at. It's lingering on the edge of snotty and then veering right on over into too thin. And maybe I need to shake it more. Need a fat tire for this combo. I need a fat tire for every conversation. Shake it like it owes you money. Shake it like you own a vortex mixer. It's not a good one for me, because when people owe me money, most of the time I just let it go. <laughs> this probably isn't good business practice, but I'm not, I'm not... I'm not a business brain. I loan people money when they're friends, and then if they owe it to me, I'm usually just kind of like, you know, you'll pay it back or you won't. If you don't, I probably won't loan it to you again, but I'm not coming after you. You tell me to shake it like it owes me money, and I'm just like, why don't you just sit there on the desk, paint, and you can decide to be mixed or not. Not the most effective technique. But your mileage may vary. Shake it like a baby at a president's pep rally. Yeah, that makes sense. Certainly makes more sense. Shake it like it keeps postponing your third cyberpunk red session. Oh god, yeah, we do need to get to that. You know, 
I definitely rushed through the other models in this uh, this set, this Eternus Continuum set, but I'm just kind of taking my time on Raxus. He's a hero figure after all. I like taking my time on characters, but when it's like, oh, now paint a squad of infantry, I'm just like, yeah, whatever, let's dry brush it. Looks good. Seal it. Put it on the table. Get out of harmony. How you doing today, man? I don't make sense. I make dollars. Which also doesn't really make any sense. The irony is perhaps the point. The world may never know. How you doing today, Chaotic Harmony? Could we pretty please get a damn it, Riot City? You know what? Let me say it. Give me a chance. This is what I get. This is what I get for having such amazing fucking mods. It's frustrating. They show me up on my own damn stream. What are you working on today, Chaotic? You've been doing a lot of painting lately, and I'm always happy to see it. Hell yeah. Oh, you at work? So, Chaotic Harmony, the other day, which actually, it was, it was yesterday, wasn't it, um, was playing Dawn of War 1 on his stream, and that really got me thinking that we should do a community game night where we all play Warhammer 40k Dawn of War, because I fucking love that game. I don't know how many of you fellows, you, you fine folks out there, have played it, but I would assume quite a few. It was a very popular game. Uh, if you haven't, it is not expensive to acquire. It is old, and it is generally on sale. It is one of the greatest real-time strategy games that has ever been made, in my opinion. It is certainly the one that I have the most fun playing. It has a great, great multiplayer, and I would love to get some game. Like, first of all, Catech Harmony, you and I should play it regardless of whether anybody else plays it with us or not. But as an addendum to that... It would be pretty cool to get like a community game night going on that one. Do like some Dawn of War and some Titanfall or something like that. I'm very interested. It's a great game, out here. It's just a fantastic game. And if you have not played Dawn of War, you really should. You really should. If you enjoy real-time strategy games at all, you should play Dawn of War 1 at least once. It is a great campaign, too. It had kind of a fun, free-form, conquer-the-planet campaign in the later expansions, sort of like the old Dune 2. More so than Command and Conquer. Command and Conquer, where it was like you pick the next territory to invade, that was all well and fun. But Dawn of War was more like you systematically conquer a planet by taking territories that give you different bonuses as you go and such.
and then you can have enemies invade your territories and you play more of a defensive mission. Oh, it's a good game. It's so good. And surprisingly decently balanced for a Warhammer 40k game. Better balanced than the tabletop game ever was. Dark Heart, you've got it? Fuck yeah. We should all sign up for EVE and start a corp. Oh, that's fun. You know what we should do? We should all download Microsoft Office and play Excel. Right? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I haven't played Eve in a long time, Roland. I have not played Eve in a long time. Hethrier, well, I'm not it's interesting. Thunderhead's trying to brush you <laughs> off, but you're just base coat, man. <laughs> uh, it's funny that Hethrier is here because Hethrier actually introduced me to Eve Online a long time ago, back when it first started. Sounds like I'm saying God of War, not Dawn of War. Two different things, the one might involve the other. I do want to play Elite Dangerous. You know what stops me is, uh, ironically, it's because I've got all these cool peripherals for Elite Dangerous. I've got my VR headset, I've got Horizons, I've got my HOTAS, you know, stick and throttle setup, and it's like, I wanna play some Elite Dangerous, but that means I have to pull out my VR setup, and I need to calibrate it, and I need to make sure everything's running, I need to update my software, I need to check my HOTAS, make sure that my key bindings are, uh, maybe I'll just, I'll just play RimWorld instead. I haven't been playing many video games lately, like, at all. I know I've mentioned this before, but I've just got periods in my life where, like, for a year, I'm like, I'm playing video games. Sweet, we're on it, we're doing it. And then, I'm just, like, not, not playing anything for a while. Lately, when I've got free time, I find it being spent in, um, like 3D design programs. Roland, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't mean to. I don't mean to insult your suggestion. I was just being a smartass. Um, I really haven't played Eve in a long time. I have no idea how it's changed since the last time I played it. I just remember the last time I played it, it was like you gain skills no matter what you're doing. So you know, set up the series of skills that you want to have, and then take a vacation. I assume it's probably still somewhat like that. I remember combat being like, set your optimal orbit, and then go get a snack. How about that new Star Sector update, though? I haven't looked at it. I know that it got one because several people have mentioned it to me, but I haven't actually looked at it. I played the demo for that game, Outriders, that came out today. I'm not sure how much I liked it. It was fun. It, it played a little Mass Effect-y. The story was interesting enough. I wasn't... I was actually more excited about the story before the time jump in the intro. It has, it has a neat story where you're like, um... You're a part of a, a group of colonists that arrive. You know, we destroyed Earth, we sent out a colony ship, the colony ship arrives at the new planet. And you're like, okay, we're setting off into this new world, and we're going to establish cities, and humanity's going to have a second chance. And I was like, this is actually kind of like something I want to play. It reminds me of, like, Mass Effect Andromeda, maybe a little bit grittier. Sweet, I'm on board. And then they have a thing happen, and your character winds up in cryosleep, and then you wake up 30 years later, and humanity is embroiled in a war. And you're like, oh, oh, no. I kind of like the way that the character addressed that, because she's just saying, I had a female avatar, she's just saying all the things that I was thinking, like, oh no, we had a second chance and you've ruined it, you've ruined it, you brought war to this new world, but the fact that she was echoing my sentiment doesn't make the setting any more interesting. I enjoyed the demo, it seemed fun, but it also seems like it's one of those, oh, this game is single player, but it's also always online kind of games, and I don't think I care. I don't think I'll be buying Outriders, but I do like that they give you a demo so you really know what the game's going to be like before you make that decision, because otherwise I probably wouldn't have even looked at it. Plus it's Squeenix. What have they ever made that's any good? 
ever. I'm kidding, they've made lots of good stuff. What class did you pick? Uh, Trickster, I think it was called, which was an odd name for the class because there's nothing about the initial abilities that have anything to do with tricking anyone. You have, like, an energy blade and a teleport and a slow field, and I don't understand what's tricksy about that. I was, I was closer, like... My combat style was up in people's faces with a shotgun, slashing them with energy blades in my hands. So I find myself wondering, what, what, what where's the trick? And, you know, it has, like, this hand-wavy excuse for now there are a bunch of people with superpowers. I'm like, eh... I liked the idea of a sci-fi game where I was setting up a, a, a colony on a new world more than I liked the idea of this I'm fighting a war on a new world thing. The trick is that there's no trick. It's a double trick. Ooh, it's the over trick. The trick was in the name. It tricked you into thinking there would be tricks. I like where your head's at, Gray Fox. Maybe I need to play more games. Maybe I need to really take some time and stop making every second that I'm on my PC devoted to 3D design before I burn myself out. Because that's a very real danger, and I'd like to avoid it. I feel like maybe I feel that coming on. So maybe more video games and less, less work for a little bit. I don't know. It's 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 tricky. I feel like I'm always trying to keep up with the Joneses, you know? Other people are out there making files, so if I'm not making files, people are getting ahead of me or something. I don't know. I don't think that's a healthy way to think about it. But it's what my brain does, you know? We've just got such lovely momentum, such lovely enthusiasm right now for Thunderhead Studio, for Hextech, for... Steel Warrior Studios for everything that I feel like it would be a shame to lose that momentum, but I don't want to burn myself out pushing it too hard either, you know? You attempted to play a game today. How, how well did that go, Riot Sister? Cool, let me fight you in Dawn of War. Chaotic Harmony, fucking... What the... Where the fuck are you right now? Where are, are you near a computer? Scout Ru... Scout Rush, you think you've got fucking jokes, Catac Harmony? You think you can fucking Scout Rush me, you son of a- You don't know. You don't know what I'm gonna do to you. You don't know how fast I can build Chaos Raptors. Let's do it. Let's play. Scout Rush. Jesus. Bush League. Fucking entry level bullshit over here. I'm gonna have fun. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and give you a, a quote from, from The Rock. I'll take pleasure in gutting you, boy. Light gray. Let's see what I can do. New TROCGL put out has a mech that has to plug itself in to fire its main gun. Wait, what? <laughs> Should have used Energizer. Don't get home till 10 30. A likely excuse. Now we see how the mighty chaotic shrinks from the challenge. they say about bullies when you stand up to them they back right down
I haven't looked at the, the, the new TRO yet, by the way. It has to plug itself in. What is it firing? Damn crisis suits done. I want to paint a new thing. By the way, yeah, you're uh, you you got a new thing in the mail as of today. I'm glad you like it. Glad you like it, Stila. How you doing? How was your Gundam adventure? Also realize that I have no idea what you do for work, because you mentioned earlier, like, oh, I'm gonna go see the Gundam. It's for work. And somehow that, that comment just, like, rolled right off me, and I'm sitting here thinking, like, what the fuck could you... How would that be for work? Maybe if you work for, like, like, in journalism or something? Maybe? I don't know. Thank you so much for getting that shout-out, Kursala. Guys! not following Steel a Rebel and you're interested in oil painting minis, you really... I don't even care if you aren't. If you're not interested in oiling painting minis and you follow Steel a Rebel and watch some of her streams, you will be soon enough. Fantastic stream, fantastic streamer, amazing painter. Please go give her a follow. She will solve all of your late night urges. That doesn't sound right. I'm meaning to convey that she streams late at night. And thus, if you're a night owl like me, she'll probably be streaming. Let, you know, let's just move on. <sighs> That's actually pretty cool, especially because I was the only one there. Oh, did you, maybe, did you, like, try to pilot it? If you're the only one there, I've seen Gundam enough times to know that if you're the only one there when there's a Gundam, you can usually steal it. And then you start a grand adventure. Oils? Oils? We're gonna be doing some oils, Greg. Were you here when I when I mentioned that? That we're gonna be doing some Oh, you changed your name again, by the way. We're back to Greg the Salt Miner. Uh yeah, we're gonna be I'm I'm, I'm gonna be trying oils on, on this guy to start with. On on my Monpoc minis, we're gonna be doing uh What is his name? Defender X or Guardian X? I think it's Defender X. And Gorgadra. The, the kaiju and the mecha who punches him in his face. Ow. Assuming I don't smack them into my microphone and break them. But they basically made it move just for me. Oh, that's very special. That's pretty cool, though. Does it move just as awkwardly and hilariously as it looks like it does in every single video? Because <laughs> it always looks just so ponderous. Steela Rebel, have you seen Shin Godzilla? Have I asked you that? I know I mentioned it to you earlier in chat, but I don't know if I asked if you've actually watched it. Be perfect for April's challenge? Awesome, because I'm going to be painting them through April. I got, I got my oils, the oils that I have, and uh, I looked at getting some other oils and like brighter colors and such, because I've really just got like a basic oil set. Where's my red? I got the, um, 
Windsor and Newton Winton oil color set. So I'm, I'm a little limited, but I figure I should be able to mix most of the colors that I need out of this basic set. And I don't want to dump any more money into oils until I have given it a real shot. And uh, I'm sure that I want to continue with it. But yeah, I finally went and just kind of pre-thinned my oils with some white spirits so that I can actually use them without having to do a bunch of thinning while I'm painting. Have not seen Shit Godzilla, should you? Yes. It's a fantastic film. It moves very slowly, but they do set up the mood. There's music and it talks. Wait, it talks? <laughs> Gundams talk? <laughs> you go ahead and lurk, Riot Sister. Replicated the 13 colors from Kimura in oils. Good mix, and you can make almost every tone with those 13. Oh, that's a good idea. I should be good with the 10 that I have, I figure. Should be. We'll see. planning on doing too crazy of colors on it. I'm just going to have to mix myself up some oranges out of my red and my yellows. And then the kaiju is going to use much more earthy and fleshy tones, and I think it won't be as tricky as the mecha, which wants more bright colors on it. Assuming we'll be getting a Gypsy Dangerous paint scheme. So, Roland, I've been thinking about that. There's another faction for Monpok that has a... The, it, it's got a... There, there's a new mecha coming out soon for a faction called Green Menace, I think they're called. Uh, they're a little bit more military than the Guard, which are more Gundam mecha. And they've got one mecha that was an old, original mecha that was destroyed by a monster in its little story. And then they they salvaged the pieces and they rebuilt it. And it's a little blockier and a little more uh, American design still with some of that Gundam flair. And that one, I was like, that's kind of perfect to paint as Gypsy Danger. So I, I don't know. Um, I am kind of leaning towards just going into a Gypsy Danger paint scheme for this one, though. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Well, Stila, obviously the only answer is for you to watch all the Gundam series right now so that you can report on the accuracy of what they're saying. Working on a sci-fi themed building, do I make it asymmetrical or just mirror the windows I love onto the other half? There's room for both, Greg the Salt Miner. Uh, symmetry in some buildings and asymmetry in others. If you love it, mirror it. You know what the real answer is? Do both. Split your file. Mirror one, see how you like it, and uh, try asymmetrical on the other. Because repeating design elements between buildings or having similar chunks between buildings gives you a uh, an aesthetic. And that repeated aesthetic people like, I find. Unifies them in a singular design. going to do the oil. So either Sunday or Tuesday. Sunday depends on a few factors, including whether or not I've been completely taken down by my COVID vaccine or not. Uh, if I have not been, if, if I am streaming Sunday, then I'm going to go ahead and dig into Monpak and try some oils out and see how it goes. Failing that, Tuesday.
Especially since they're stackable. Yeah, definitely. I don't see any mechs under the Green Fury faction. It's a new one. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, yeah, because right now Green Fury has, like, what, Sergeant Titanica as their primary monster? And that's just, you know, the 50-foot the woman. Um, they have one, though. I can't remember the name of it. Stop bouncing around and finish your jet. No, don't tell me what to do. I'm going to paint all the damn things. I've actually been working on my jacks a little bit. I just wanted to uh, work on Raxus for the sake of streaming because he's a character. And I don't like doing assembly line painting on stream as much as I like doing character painting. So I tend to save the individual models and the characters for the stream and then work on the like line troops or things where I'm painting two or three models in the same scheme at once uh, in my personal time. what I did though, I got all of my Iron Star Alliance assembled and ready for priming. I just try to seize motivation whenever I have it, and in the last few days I've been like, I feel like building models, so I just went ahead and did it. Earth Knight is the robot. Thank you, Hethrier. Yeah, its it, its story is like it was the first of the guard robots. I think it was called Laser Knight, and it was destroyed in the first battle, and then they salvaged it and rebuilt it. Something like that. I don't, I don't really, I don't remember. New Jacks look pretty badass. I agree. Stila, I showed you the yeah, you were here last time. I showed you the nemesis that got the the basic primer job on it, didn't I? The one who is mostly jetpack. I really love the look of that one. That one may get a painting stream of its own because I only have one of them. Whereas the Scourges are more likely to be finished off stream. Yeah, you see what I mean, Roland? I saw that one and I was like, ooh, that one wants a Gypsy Danger paint scheme. Maybe I'll do something more Gundam-y for Guard. I'm not sure yet. So I might just go with the standard Studio Guard paint scheme. I'm honestly undecided. I've been doing more Studio paint schemes lately and not necessarily hating it. I used to be very, I have to come up with my own scheme for every single model that I paint all the time. And that's just kind of not true for me anymore. Now it's more just like the act of painting and doing a good job on the paint job. Rather than trying to strongly differentiate by choosing every little color. classes compared to Iron Kingdom. I guess they were called jobs. You mean insofar as the Warjacks go? They're just, uh, they're classified by weight so far. So you got light ja uh, So far for each faction we only have one light jack and one heavy jack.
I think they've differentiated somewhat more than that in their, their Kickstarter news for some of the new units. There are like witch hunters and theurges and stuff like that. It's all kind of still developing. They haven't actually released the full rulebook. Well, I mean, they, there is a fully functional rulebook to play Warcaster with. But like as far as an independently published non-pamphlet rulebook, they don't even have that out yet. Warcaster is still very much in its nascent phase. It's it's still being born, if you will, as a game. Is this a version of Thriller? This is Bouncy Electro House, but it sounds a lot like Thriller. Either way, I don't like it. Make it go away. New jacks they've showed off that belong to cadres can only be taken with certain other models. Yeah, I saw that. It's sort of a take on the theme list without being a theme list, where it's like you take a, a group of models as a choice. I'll be very interested to see how that final implementation works out. clean off my wet palette before I started painting and I just sort of didn't do it, so, you know, whatever. Now we face the consequences. Of not having as much space to mix as I want. I have phases when I'm painting. Like, I've definitely got phases where I'm like, ah, oh, this is really fun, and I'm doing a good job, and I'm trying a new thing, and it's working. Hooray, I'm a good painter. And then I have other phases where I'm painting, and I'm like, have I forgotten everything that I learned in the last few years? Am I a worse painter now than I was six months ago? I think it's all mental. I'm kind of in one of those second phases right now where I feel like I'm doing a worse job than I did before. <laughs> Ugh. Brains. Why are brains so stupid? Romeo Void, have a fantastic evening, man, and thank you for being here. Probably has to do with me being tired today. Not Romeo Void leaving, just my general feeling. Same with learning languages. Yeah, it, it's, it's weird. It goes in like fits and starts and... Sometimes it all clicks and other times it's more of a slog. But I mean, it's all progress. As long as you're trying new things and you keep working. Negative progress isn't really a thing so much.
sure you guys have had those days, though, when you sit down to paint, you're like, do I know how to do this? Because I feel like I've forgotten all the stuff I'm supposed to be doing. How do highlights work again? why I talk about the, the threshold when you're painting minis where it's like if you just keep going at a certain point you should you should reach that point where you're like okay now I start to see what it is that I'm doing sometimes you're just throwing down color and hoping it's gonna work and then you hit a point where you're like oh yeah there it is there's the mini there's the paint job I meant to do There's a Blood Dragon sequel. Wait, the, like the game? Blood Dragon? Hey, you forgot her. I'm good to see you. When you feel good, you're in a plateau, or at least they say... Yeah, there's probably some truth to that. If you're too comfortable, it means you're not doing anything interesting. Certainly not challenging yourself when you're too comfortable, eh? Particularly applies to times when I'm like, I want to do like a bunch of layers on these on these highlights, and I get halfway through and I'm like, no, it's not going good. I push through that final layer, it usually makes all the difference. Swap up one color and see if I'm happy with it. On up to bleach linen. Is the store report closed? It shouldn't be. Is it snowing where you are where you are, Virg? It's a birthday miracle. Just for Vergaderon. What's that horrible song that makes me want to throw up that they sing in The Grinch? Ooh, to Square, thank you so much for the reminder. Hang on just one second. You think I might just, uh, take a fucking nap after this, you guys? I'm really just, oof. And then I'll wake up at, like, 3 a.m. and want to paint. Makes sense. That sounds healthy. Get off my fucking clipper. Model experiencing some technical difficulties. Oh, you're gonna have to get a proper clean out, aren't you? Okay. Alright, okay. 
set you over here. Who needs a normal sleep schedule? I mean, apparently not me, because I haven't had one for way too damn long. Ah, have a little drinky poo. Oh. I wish I'd started paying attention to my posture when I was a child, back when they told me to, and I was like, I know better, I'll live forever, and my back will always be great. They were like, okay, idiot, and I was like, haha, stupid adults, and uh, yeah, they were right, and uh, I should have been paying more attention back then. Developing good habits. What is your birthday wish for Gatarung now that it's snowing? Wish upon a snowflake. Is that a thing? It should be. Saw a board game that has the original Ghostbusters teaming up with the Men in Black. That actually seems very appropriate. Like, just thematically speaking, they're very similar. And also, uh, in, in overall presentation and level of comedy, they're very similar. And that they're characters in extremely comedic situations who are played pretty straight. Except for Bill Murray, who seems to be in on every single joke everywhere all the time. And, okay, Rick Moranis a little bit. He, he's pretty jokey in that movie, but he's Rick Moranis, you know? Like, that's that was always going to happen. Sony has rights to both. I'd watch it. Did anybody here ever play the Ghostbusters video game? Because I own it, and i got to tell you, I still haven't. But I've heard nothing but good things about it. I keep feeling like I should? I have been told that it's sort of like the closest thing we're ever going to get to a real Ghostbusters 3. Which seems very likely since the next foray into Ghostbusters is going to be Finn Wolfhard and Ghostbuster Babies or whatever. Not the- no, not the NES one. I'm talking about the most recent Ghostbusters, the video game. Came out a handful of years ago on PC and maybe PlayStation. I don't know what its console exclusive was, or if it even was console exclusive. haven't heard good things. Have you heard bad things? Have you heard nothing at all? Because that could be a misleading statement. I haven't heard good things doesn't actually mean anything. Hearing bad things, that's different. Traumatized by the Ace of Inter- Wait. Wait. What? Are you saying that they're rebooting Ace Ventura? Because this is literally the first I've heard of that, and I have this feeling inside of me. And it... It's weird. It's like I'm... angry and sad, and I kind of want to be sick a little bit. But it's, it's just sort of manifesting as... Uh, 
a little bit of a headache. It's from, but it's a kid. Oh no, 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 no. 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 No, 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 no. 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 Nope. 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 No. 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 There's something about Kenobi and Cat Girls that give me that warm, fuzzy feeling. Or maybe it's just my allergies. <laughs> you know the East Ventura movies by heart in Italian. Oh my god. That meant so much what I want. Like, for my birthday, what I want is to, like, sit Stila in a room and have a bottle of wine and have her recite the entirety of Ace Ventura in Italian. That would just be amazing. It would probably also be, like, a helpful language primer, too, because uh, I'd, I'd know... I, I would know what she was saying, and I'd be like, oh, that's that word in Italian, okay. That's how you say le who the her, but, but in Italian. movies and I never know shit so I thought about it was old news yeah I, I that is one that I managed to avoid hearing about Sela so thank you for completely ruining at least some portion of my life forever though it's not really you who did it you just made me aware of it So in a way, it's good, you know? It's better to be hurt by a friend than a stranger, I suppose. <laughs> or as Dwight Schrute would say, it's better to be hurt by someone that you know accidentally than by someone you don't know on purpose. That sounds terrible, but the good news is I will never see it, so it might as well not exist as far as I'm concerned. I just wish that it didn't exist at all. The The Finn Wolfhard Ghostbusters movie almost tempts me just because it has Paul Rudd, and that's fucking cheating. Because I love Paul Rudd. Everybody loves Paul Rudd. Who doesn't like Paul Rudd? Who out there in this world, what jaded cynical, damaged person is like, fucking Paul Rudd, I hate that guy. What has to happen to you in your life to dislike Paul Rudd?
Mmm, Jimmy Woo. Jimmy Woo doesn't dis- no, he doesn't dislike Paul Rudd. He wanted to get dinner with him. Admittedly, it wasn't his idea, but he was, you know, on board for it. And he was mystified by his up-close magic. which he has since perfected. Didn't really like Ant-Man, but I like Paul Rudd's performance. See, that's what I'm saying, though. It's like, Paul Rudd can be in a movie, and you'd be like, I don't like that movie. But Paul was charming. Because he is. He has he has screen charisma. He has that X factor. That actors are always trying to sort of bottle and capitalize on, and for the most part, fail at. And it just seems to come so effortlessly to him. It helps that I also like Ant-Man both as a as a character and as a property. I'll be the first to admit that Ant-Man and the Wasp was a better movie though than the first Ant-Man. Yeah, Asri, they really fucked up Yellow Jacket in that movie. He wound up being wholly uninteresting. And he was just evil for the sake of being evil. There was like a throwaway line in there that was like, oh, you're not supposed to transform without using the special helmet. You'll go crazy. And I guess he did, and he went crazy, and that's why he was a bad guy, but it was like not well explored. Just in general, Yellow Jacket was not well explored. And he fell into the Marvel trap of, who's our first villain? Well, he has the same powers as the hero, but he's evil. The tried and true formula. Punisher's second movie is the best Marvel movie. That was the one with uh, Titus Polo in it, right? Um, uh, Ray... Somebody help me out. I bet Roland knows exactly who I'm talking about. Ray... Somebody. Ray Stevenson? Yeah. I quite liked Tom Jane's Punisher. I don't think it was the best movie. I don't necessarily think it was the best Punisher movie, but I liked the movie overall. I thought it had a lot of heart, had a couple really good performances. It had some also some very stupid and unfortunate choices that were made in it, but a lot of what was going on was good. His only motivation. I am CEO, therefore I am evil. No, 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 no. Not Dolph Lundgren. No. Come on. <laughs> I'm glad you've seen it, though, Giddy Eve. How you doing today, man? And Heresy Killer, good to see you. By the way, could we get a shout-out? Pretty pleased for Heresy Killer. A truly fantastic painter. Definitely worth your follow. What's the best way to make a wash and use it on my model? So, the easiest way is to buy something that's already formulated to be a wash. Because making your own wash can be very tricky. I suppose the fastest and easiest way would be to take a uh, highly pigmented paint and thin it with a great deal of water and flow aid. You definitely want some flow aid in there because it is formulated to break the surface tension and ensure that it flows down into crevices and doesn't gather on surfaces, which is a problem you're going to have with converting a lot of regular paints into washes. Hmm. 
What happened to Steiner Miniatures? He changed his name. Manro Fasal, his name is now Thick Mike! Yes, that was Gideev. That was, uh, yeah, John Travolta was the bad guy in, um, the Tom Jane Punisher. It did, it had wonderful moments, Heresy Killer. I liked his little moment after he beat the fucking Russian when they tumble down the stairs and he stands up and he's standing over his body and he's kind of swaying and looking all fucked up and he's just like, I'm standing. He's not. And then he just falls over backwards. <laughs> and I really, really like the moment that, um, oh, fuck, I'm going to forget everybody's name as I talk about this. The actor's name, it's right on the tip of my stupid pop culture laden brain. Somebody help me out. He was the hitman second in command in The Punisher. He was the main bad guy in The Patriot. The whole fight scene is the best in any... Yeah, when he, he goes under the, the desk and he pulls out his revolver to get at the Russian and the Russian grabs his hand, slams it down on the table, smacks the barrel of the gun with a barbell and then just releases him. And Tom Jane picks up the gun and looks at it and the, the barrel is just wonked off at a 45 degree angle. It's like, ah, shit. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. And um, his other little trick where he hits the, he goes behind the, the, the toilet tank on his toilet and pulls out a grenade and he throws it at the Russian and he hits his clever little button that goes to close the door and the Russian just goes, Tink, and knocks it back as if he's playing baseball and just whoop, goes flying back into the bathroom at him. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful just for the number of little tricks he tries to pull out that just, just don't work, like at all. The guy's just ready for him. It's not Lucius Malfoy. I can't remember, but it was the second in command in that movie that John Travolta winds up killing. There's just a beautiful moment between them when, when John Travolta's murdering him, and you can tell he doesn't want to. He's all broken up and sad. And this dude has been killing people the whole movie. He's just a merciless, evil son of a bitch, but not with his best friend. And he just keeps asking him as he's stabbing him. He doesn't try to defend himself. He doesn't fight back. He's just like, why are you, do why are you doing this? Will Patton, thank you so much, Roland. Yeah, it's Will Patton, and it's a great performance. It's just like, why, why, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you, you're killing me. What, why are you killing me? He keeps asking him, just so confused by what's happening. It's like, almost touching, if he wasn't a sociopath. Package from Green Stuff World is here. Hell yeah, what'd you get, Greg? keep having trouble with consistency today. I don't know. There we go. I'm so glad to have Scandroid back in the music rotation. I was missing them. Is it weird I'm revisiting the old Christopher Reeve Superman films? I don't think at all, Roland. I've actually kind of had that urge lately myself. I haven't done it. But ever since watching Zack Snyder's Justice League, I'm like, I'm going to go get me some of that, uh, that Christopher Reeve action. At least the first two. Superman 3 is pretty fucking silly. I mean, they're all pretty fucking silly. But they're not Man of Steel bad. They all make me go, oh, Clark, as opposed to going, what the fuck, Clark? Which is what Man of Steel makes me do. Picked up premium. Premium what? 
What did I, what premium thing did I get? See, I'm going to argue with you on that one, Greg. Because Superman is many types of character. Because Superman has existed for over twice our lifespans. Superman has existed for so long. And he has passed through so many artists and writers that he has been many things at many times, including uh, being of various power levels. And it's sort of like, which Superman do you want? Because you can absolutely find Mary Sue Superman, who's just unreasonably good at things. We're going to be doing it here in about, oh shit, four minutes, Hethrier. And, um... Uh, most of the time I paint, I fight with consistency. It's always either too damn dry or too damn wet. My question to paint manufacturers, no, this is an issue. Why do they not make the paint work just right out of the pot? Get Eve, that's a complex question, the complex answer, because there is no one consistency that truly is perfect. The, cons the consistency that works well for you will vary based on what you're trying to do, um, what kind of a prime job you have, whether you're base coating, whether you're layering. They have to aim for somewhere in the middle and try to get a consistency that can be um, either thickened by letting it dry a little bit or thinned easily enough. I find that Pro Acryl has some of the best right out of the bottle consistency, which actually, I think I have a color I should be using from Pro Acryl instead of this one. Why am I not doing that? I'm using Reaper. Well, I know why. It's because their ivory is not, uh, it's not, it's not really what I want. I need a brighter color than that. They've got bright ivory. Did that work? Let me try it. I haven't used bright ivory. Like, look, this is... I, I literally have used this maybe one time. You can tell because of the, the cap there. Oh, yeah. No, the, the John Williams Superman theme music? Fuck yeah. I agree. Reaper, uh, particularly Reaper Master Series, is really, really great out of the bottle. Now, Superman has been changed because back in the day when Superman was just Superman and he didn't, there wasn't Justice League or anything like that, and comic book writers were like, yeah, and then he punches the villain, you see? Ha ha ha! It wasn't as important to have anything like a balanced character. Over time, as he's interacted with other superheroes, his power levels have fluctuated and varied depending on who's writing him. My favorite version of Superman is kind of the one that existed in the era, the era of Superman the Animated Series. His power level got dropped down. I, I've actually used Bright Warm Gray on this one already. And I think that Bright Ivory is just a little bit brighter. You see that? I'm going to try this out because I realize I haven't used it. The, the animated series level of Superman, though, he was significantly weaker than he generally is in the comics, and that made it much easier to write for him. And in addition to that... They gave him a weakness against not just Kryptonite, but also magic. So when you're dealing with the larger universe of DC, you can now have characters, you know, magical characters fight him and be able to weaken him without Kryptonite always having to be involved. And that really, really did improve the writing quite a lot, in my opinion, when you were able to actually give, you know, great scenarios where, well, this is a guy that Batman can fight, but Superman can't. This is a guy that Constantine can fight, but Superman can't. Like, the, the Superman this week against magic would get just completely fucking wrecked by, um, like, Dr. Fate, for instance. Or, or even, um, Zatanna or Zatara, or any of their villains. Yeah, actually, this is the color that I want. This is slightly brighter than what I was using, and I'm totally going to use this now. Damn. Wish I'd known about this earlier. That's what I get for not fully exploring my paint sets. Yeah, this is going down nicer. Okay, found my new highlight. Nice. I like... One of the things they did with Superman in the context of Justice League Unlimited. Let's take a look at the... I'm really, I'm really going slow. <laughs> Fuck this paint job, guys. He's taking me forever. I'm probably going to lay into him some uh, late tonight and tomorrow and try to have um, old, old Raxus here done this weekend. Once I'm able to get the armor plates done, the fabric is going to go much quicker. And then I think this bright red is going to help everything else pop on the model. Steeler Rebel, you go have lunch. Thank you so much for being here.
Um, Steel, but seriously, thank you for thank you for coming in. I know it can be tricky given our given our our disparate time zones, but uh, it's always nice to see you. Yeah, okay, that, that true enough, Daytor and Voltari, but it wasn't. It, it, it grew over time until it became not just, oh, he can be enchanted, but, like, any magical power at all will weaken him significantly. Now, I could be mistaken. I don't think that came in until later, where it was just magic, as a rule, will drop his power level significantly. But in addition to that, they made him significantly physically weaker. But the thing that they did with Clark, with Superman, in Justice League Unlimited... And someone could probably note, and the old ones that had the different colors of kryptonite. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. They had, like, the black kryptonite that split him into two and crazy bullshit like that. How you doing today, Drippins? Um, the thing that I liked they kind of played up a lot in Justice League Unlimited was he wasn't a good team player because Clark Kent, because Kal-El has... He has a, a Superman complex. Superman is effectively invulnerable for most purposes, right? Okay. He's fighting alongside powered humans and unpowered humans who are not invulnerable, and he views it as his duty to take damage upon himself in order to prevent them from taking damage. And what this means is that in a fight, he tries to do too much. When he's supposed to be handling his part of a fight, and Batman is supposed to be handling his part of a fight, and Batman's got something going on, Superman would rush over and try to take a hit that Batman might have been about to take, and in so doing, completely interrupt the plan, throw them off, and, and wind up with the team taking even more damage than it should have otherwise. So Clark had to... kind of get over that. He had, he had a sort of masochism about him. Uh, a savior complex that he had to let go of and accept that other people who weren't Superman were also capable of fighting these fights. It, it was one of the most interesting bits of, of real characterization that they ever gave him for me. Definitive statement was in uh, Superman 171, Mitzi Spitlick fucked him up, fucked him up, that's, a, yeah, okay, that's, that's a better sentence, because he was fully vulnerable to magic, thank you, Mort Weisinger, though I do agree the show highlighted it better for storytelling purposes, there you go, Daytron Voltar, yeah, they just made it more of like a, no, this is always a thing, also, yeah, I can pronounce Mixie Spitlick, so, fuck you, I mean, no, that, that okay, that might have been a little bit of an escalation, Daytron, I'm always glad to have you, <laughs> I fucking hate Mitzi, uh, Mr. Mitzi Spitlick. He's such a ridiculous character. And the trick is always, ooh, get him to say his own name. <laughs> Come on, man. <sighs> There's some goofy characters left over from those the, the original days of DC. But yeah, Justice League Unlimited is great. If you have any doubts, Greg, if you have any doubts about Superman as a character, sit down and stream... Justice League Unlimited. But what you should do is you should stream Batman the Animated Series followed by Superman the Animated Series followed by Justice League and then Justice League Unlimited and then um, Young Justice. But if you're just going to stream one of them, make it Justice League Unlimited. Because that show is so good. Oh, that show is so good. Oh, I want to eat my rush. It's so good. Now I'm thinking about it. <sighs> on to something completely different. Got the final permits in today's city, and HOE can go fuck themselves on building a goddamn pool. A goddamn pool. Is that like, is it going to be filled with unholy water? A lot of people don't like Superman. I'm never going to argue, I'm never going to try to argue into liking Superman, Greg the Salt Miner. What I'm going to say is, if you have the time for a short delve into quality Superman writing, um, if you have time for a long delve, do Justice League Unlimited. If you have time for a short delve, ideally read, but if you're not going to read, then just watch the movie of All-Star Superman, because that is amazing. All-Star Superman is the best that Superman has ever been and some of the best writing he's ever gotten. I love All-Star Superman. They do so many interesting things with him, and they really delve into who he is as a person. 
and that was written by Datron Voltari. Help me out. That was not... It was... Was it Alan Moore who wrote All-Star Superman? It wasn't Grant Morrison. It might have been Alan Moore. Maybe I have that mixed up. It's something in my eye, and I don't know what. Hang on. Grant Morrison, okay. I knew it was one of the two, but I couldn't remember. Grant Morrison had a good run there where he wrote for not just Superman, but he also wrote the Hugh Flashpoint Paradox. I know he did a string of writing for The Flash that was some of the best writing The Flash ever got. In general, Grant Morrison has probably realized DC superheroes better than almost anyone ever has. Uh, Frank Miller can take a long fucking walk off of a short pier. Um, I, I, I hate what he does with DC. I hate it. I don't really love what he does with Marvel, but I feel like Marvel is better suited to Frank Miller's really, really dark style of writing. Even Batman. I, I don't care that Batman is supposed to be the Dark Knight and he's supposed to be gritty and blah, 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 whatever. I feel like um, uh, Frank Miller just drags him down. Drags him down into the fucking muck. On every bad day you ever had, Barry. It was me, Barry. It was me all along. That's one of my favorite revelations. Um, that, that reverse flash and I have to note that they kind of I'm about to give some spoilers for WandaVision there's a character in WandaVision that has a moment of revelation where they reveal like all the things that have been going wrong that have been super mysterious it was me all along <laughs> and I feel like DC has missed the boat because everybody loved that moment in WandaVision and it became like a meme and that was totally reverse flash's moment that is totally Reverse Flash's moment, where he has that moment where he reveals, he's like, Hey, Barry, you remember when your dog got hit by a car when you were 10 years old? That was me. <laughs> Do you remember when you were going down to the basement to get something for your mother and you tripped and you broke your arm? That was me. I guess not for his mother, because he killed her. But, um, yeah, like he revealed almost every bad thing that has happened to Barry Allen over the course of his life was a psychotic, time-traveling future speedster who was determined not necessarily to ruin Barry's life, but to make him better through adversity. So he goes back in time and kills his dog and, and knocks him down the stairs and, and, and ruins his homework and <laughs> just... Just fucks him up. Just, just destroy. I don't want to say he destroys his whole life. He just makes it measurably worse, <laughs> and you know messes with his head in the process. But yeah, yeah, the whole Agatha all along, like that, 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 that could have been reverse flashes. And now when DC tries to do it, people are gonna go, oh, it's like Agatha. Kind of like when they do Dark Side, everyone goes, "Oh, it's like Thanos." And it's because I mean, yeah, it pretty much is. And Marvel just kind of, just kind of did it first. Man, oh man, I've had really slow painting days lately. All the toast that fell wrong side down, it was me. I mean, yeah, it was shit. Just that petty though. Waffles, thick Mike, how you doing there, Chrysala? Thank you so much for getting that shout out in. I think he's the guy that put Barry Allen's dad in jail, but not 100%. Well, yeah, he killed his mother. Reverse Flash murdered Flash's mother and then got his father blamed for it. So, yes, he did put uh, Flash's dad in jail for, for false charges. And that song is stuck in your head. Again, right, it's catchy as all hell. Absolutely catchy. Thank you for getting that shout out there, Chrysala. Thick Mike, how you doing today, man? Simpsons did The Simpsons did everything. Simpsons did absolutely everything. You know what the one thing the Simpsons didn't do? The one thing Simpsons didn't do? All right, locusts and gentle mechs, get ready to feast your eyes on Glor Pate and wet palettes with the occasional culinary atrocity thrown in on tonight's Storm Report. Brought to you by viewers like you. They didn't do the Storm Report. But we're about to. Oh, come on, White Wolf, that was good. No, that was, no, oh, come on. I, that, that was, that was okay. That wasn't terrible. 
<laughs> oh, let's get busy and see what people are sharing with us tonight. Come on. Come on, White Wolf. It was kind of funny. Ah, tough crowd. Tough room. <laughs> okay. Here we have up first from Kursala. Oh, excuse me. See, Thick Mike liked it, and Heresy Killer's laughing. I presume at what I said. I don't, I'm, I'm just going to assume that it was because of, of what I did. On the previous stream, I mentioned that Tiny Hands and I did some traditional art, and here it is. First, the top image was reference she picked. We searched for Spring Sunset. And our paintings are on the bottom. The goal of these activities is to teach her new techniques while she gives me instructions on what slash where to paint. Hmm, interesting. Uh, this one had us working on wet blending and stippling with a little bit of layering thrown in for good measure. I'm not going to tell which one is mine, but you're welcome to guess. I'm going to guess yours is on the right. But it's interesting to me. I, I don't want to use the word better in reference to any part of this because that's not the point of this exercise. I'm going to say that I find the grass and flowers on the right more interesting, more compelling. Not necessarily more more compa I find them more uh, pleasing. I like the bright colors used on the left, but I think that the work on the right is not necessarily cleaner so much as a better representation of the overall art. I also feel like the the sun on the right is a better representation of exactly. Well, no, not necessarily. I don't even think it's a better representation. I like the sun on the left better. I think the sun on the left is more interpretive and a bit more creative than the one on the right, which seems very literal and defined to me, which doesn't really match with the image that we're seeing, where we're not actually seeing the sun, we're seeing its reflection against the clouds. And you've got more of that orange on the left. So which one did which? is my curiosity. Again, I'm guessing that you did the one on the right, and I like elements of it, but I like... I think I like the one on the left better. It's rougher in areas, but then they're both kind of rough, and that's not really the point. Yours is the one on the right, okay. Well, I think the point I'm trying to get across here, Kursala, is that Tiny Hands kicked your ass and you lost. So, you know... Deal with that, apparently, scrub. I'm sorry, that's... No, clearly not. Those are both really, really cool, though. I, I like the nature of this of this project. This is really nice. Shilling for Tiny Hands already. Well, uh, Tiny Hands is clearly the future of Rainy River Designs. I gotta get on board with the next generation, okay? Because these old folks, these old folks, they're gonna die out. And they're gonna leave their fortune. In tiny hands, tiny hands. And I want to ride that gravy train, okay? Any suggestions for the next painting? Something cool. This is all, like, you've got a lot of cool colors in the bottom of it. Well, really, you've got, you've got your blues and your greens, but they're all a little desaturated compared to the very, very warm tones that kind of overtake the, I mean, you know, any sunset's going to have lots of warmth. But something cool. I don't want to immediately be like, oh, do the moon, because you just did a sunset. But maybe something with an ocean. Something aquatic, something coastal. Maybe like um, like, a, like a Nova Scotian shoreline or something like that. You know, something with lots of grays and blues. That could be cool. I like that idea. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us, Kursala. I think that's fucking awesome. Here we have from to Square, getting 10 ice ferrets, and the Kickstarter is handy. Glorbed on a coat of contrast, Achillean green, then used army painter crystal blue, and hydra turquoise to dry brush. Plan on finishing it and the Irby this weekend. This is showing improvement. It looks like you started with a much darker color this time, and you were more aggressive with a brighter color for your dry brush, and I think that it has paid off significantly. Have I asked before to square what brush you're using? 
you get a little bit of streakiness here. So like right here on the shoulders. And this is something that can usually be solved by using um, a softer bristle brush and by making sure you get more of the paint off before you do the dry brushing. This looks fantastic. The, the, the contrast is really nice, and I imagine that at average viewing distance at your three to five foot, it actually really, really pops. But this is why I say it's good to use the back of your hand, either your skin or a glove with a little bit of texture on it to test your dry brushing. Do a real aggressive dry brush on the back of your hand. You should pick up the texture of your skin without leaving any paint streaks across using the Army Painter dry brush. Okay, that's, that's, that's probably part of it. Uh, the basic dry brushes are not as soft as makeup brushes. Um, yeah, if you're going to continue with dry brushing, you don't have to, obviously. I think this looks fucking fantastic. Um, but if you want to continue with dry brushing, I do recommend picking up at least one, uh, like a makeup contouring brush. I use facial contouring brushes from ELF. Um, I've got their, their big ultimate blending brush for things like terrain and stuff. Yeah, definitely get yourself a makeup brush. It just, it just makes it a little bit easier. But, this actually looks really good now. This is showing measurable progress since the last one that you've done. Definitely, I can see you leaning into that contrast more, and that is a big part of bringing out the details, particularly in models of this scale. Really nicely done, Squared. Really happy with the shading on the gun arm. Yeah, no, it, it looks really nice. You can actually... It, it's a matter of taking the details that are already on the Mini and... and showing them to the viewer when they view them at the average viewing distance because it all blends together if it's too close. Very nicely done. Also, that's a lot of ice ferrets. Here we have from Larabic. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, a new Anaknarok spider. I have a mage on the rock summoning it out of its home. Oh, that's a cool idea, like standing over it and kind of conjuring so that it's... I hate this. Like, I love it. It's cool, I love the idea of it crawling out, particularly since it's crawling out of such a tiny little crevice. Like, that's just like spiders, isn't it? You're like, oh, nothing could possibly fit in that tiny little crack, and then some horrid legs come out, and you're like, ah. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm getting from this. Uh, yeah, it's one of those, oh, thanks, I hate it. <laughs> oh, God. The mage summoning it is going to be cool, too. It's a neat model. And of course, knowing Larabic, we're going to have some nice, bright, contrasting colors on this guy. I'll be very curious to see how you contrast the rocks with the spider. That's going to be damn neat. Larabic, thank you for sharing with us. Yeah, nightmare fuel. Seriously. Okay. Okay. Hethrir. Who's showing up who? Who's, who's showing up who now, buddy boy? Because here's Hathrier's own, own take on Hyrathios Raxus. But, you know, his is done. And I'm sitting here working on mine for like a week and making shit for practice. Or shit for progress. This looks really good, dude. I, I love that deep blue base that you've gone with. I think it actually works surprisingly well next to that slightly warm but very dark gray. Well, you know, just because I say things doesn't mean that I mean them. You were supposed to go, oh, I could never do that, Thunderhead. I could never show you up on your own stream. It was an opportunity for you to be humble. And you just went for it. You went right for the throat, right for the jugular. Now here I am bleeding out. This actually is really fucking good work, Athrear. I really like this, uh, this, this subdued blue-gray that we have over the majority of the figure. And I like how you've picked out all these individual little glowy bits around his central little chest reactor. This is very nicely done. The glow effect works wonderfully. This is one of the... I, I have the, 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 the privilege of seeing most of the figures that Hethrir paints. We, we share a lot privately. And this is one of the better figures that you've done lately. I think this came across quite, quite excellently. And then, of course, we have Baron Morgrave. I think I just ordered myself one of these so that I can do Baron Morgrave for my... Uh, Eternus Continuum Forces. I think that the hair you've done here, this is quite possibly the best hair that you've done. This works shockingly well, and it's a wonderful focal point. You have two of them. Bam, bam. Here in the sword, 
I think these work incredibly well considering how dark the rest of the figure is. This little bit of red here on the, the tabard, if you will, I think works nicely. The glow effect on the chest is kind of just enough. And then this amazing focal point in the, uh, the silver hair, which you've shaded very well and given a very nice sheen. And then again, the sort of light NMM on the sword here draws just enough interest. I think it is. I, I think it is. I, I haven't seen every single piece of hair that you ever painted on every model, but comparing to recent work of yours that I've seen, I think this is the best hair you've done. I think it works really, really well. It's, it's excellently shaded, and I say this as someone who struggles painting hair myself. The face looks good, too. He doesn't have a lot of face to show because he's wearing like his little Sub-Zero scorpion mask. But uh, the eyes come across pretty excellently. Nicely done, Hathrear. I'm, I'm just glad to see some Warcaster in my Storm Report, man. Oh, thank you. Hathrear, honestly, thank you for posting those, man. Here we have from Vergaderung. More than half of the American Militia mechs got finished this month. 24 of them, plus all the infantry. Took something you said to heart about not highlighting every strand. Yeah, that's something that I think the best hair I've done was recently when I painted uh, Natasha Romanoff, when I paste, painted, pasted, when I pasted Black Widow, uh, when I painted Black Widow. I think it's the best hair that I've done in a long time. And yeah, I was, th that's the one that, that I talked to you about when we were up there playing Warcaster, where you just like, it, I was always tempted to highlight every strand, but it never worked out the way I wanted it to until I realized that it needed to be more broad regions of color across the hair. And then a few little strands picked out here and there where it would catch the light, just to give it that, because hair has an odd sheen to it. It's not shiny, unless it's like really oily, but it's always a little oily, so it has a very unique, non-metallic sheen that is hard to capture. Some people out there are just like, yeah, I painted some hair and it worked really well, but for whatever reason I've always struggled with it. Yeah, I think that came out wonderfully. Uh, I sculpted and redid the crystal forests and sculpted the alien trees. The fluid works got airbrushed too. I will have to finish it later. I love this picture. I love this picture. I, I'm loving what you're doing with the mech bays. Contrasting the internal mechanical parts with the outer plates. Uh, same thing with the airbrushing that we've got done here on some of these fluid works. Looks like you've got a good number of the, the, the pipes done up. I, I think I said earlier... Of course, I'm focusing on my own shit on this board, when what you're showcasing are these fucking excellent looking crystals, which have much more of the that translucent effect really comes across on these ones now, and these, you know, creepy alien testicle trees, which look surprisingly good once printed and painted. And I think that I said before on Discord, I'm pretty sure that Vergaderung must have, like, one of the most complete and best looking hex-based Battletech tables on the planet Earth. Like, maybe there are one or two people that have tables at this point that might look better to his, depending on your preferred aesthetic, but... Forgotterung, you have some truly amazing shit at this point. Between the, 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 the hex tech that you've printed out and you've done such a good job on, and then the items that you've added to that set yourself, your trees... Your rivers are so, so fucking good, man. And you don't see anybody else doing, like, alien trees. Like, everyone talks about it. It seems so obvious. Oh, crystal forests and alien trees. But how many people have really done it? A few people might have done it for their individual tables, but nobody has made replicatable files like you have. And these look amazing. These look so cool. These are, This is what I want for my... In fact, I'm going to... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to print some Brigada Run stuff. I'm going to turn around, I'm going to print myself some rivers, or some rivers in some of these forests, because these look so fucking good. And I'm always the one who's complaining about, like, why does every Battletech table have to look like it's happening in, you know, Washington State? It's not on Earth, we're on alien planets. Space planets don't have to be fucking boring, we're talking about a game about dudes who pilot giant space robots. I'm always the one complaining when people are like, Oh, we need to move. We need some Battletech buildings that look more realistic and more like modern military stuff. I'm like, why? Why? This is a game about giant robots with Nero helmets and, and space invaders from beyond the galactic plane. Like, what? I'm jealous for God around. That's what this, that's what this feeling is deep down inside of me that I'm wrestling with. 
That's what this feeling is. That, that, that I can't quite articulate. It's just pure, unadulterated, violent jealousy. Of how awesome your fucking table looks, man. Your city looks better than my city, and I made it. <laughs> oh my god, but it is exciting to see the fluid works getting printed up. I can always rely on Vergaderung to show the absolute best face of my own work as well as his own. This Merrick Militia looks incredible. Absolutely incredible. Vergaderung. I... What, what more is there to say? What more is there to say? I need some inspiration for the light alien trees... Maybe something that has more of, like, a pod on the bottom and then some tall... Well, I don't know about tall, thin strands. That can get tricky when when you're doing 3D printing. Because that can, that can break off easily. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good idea. Look around Satisfactory. Find some shapes that you like. Because there are plenty of wacky, wacky alien uh, trees and plants in that one. All hail. What, who, who are you hailing, Darkheart? Forgot her because I could totally see that. Here we have from Play and Win. The metallics from the earlier Captain America were a prep for Iron Man. I've always been a fan of the monochromatic Iron Man suits. I just saw the original Iron Man movie. Oh, he saw the original Iron Man movie at the wee age of 11. Jesus Christ, I sometimes forget. How I was, gonna about to, I was about to say I forget how young Play and Win is, and then I realized what I truly forget is how old I am. Because Play and Win is a grown man. He's he's married and has a house. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> and he saw Iron Man at eleven. <laughs> oh God. Okay. And the Mark II was my favorite, so I decided to go that route for the model. This is two shades of steel plus the silver for the arc reactor and repulsors, which doesn't pick up too well on camera. Also, the picture looks like I glitter bombed the model. I would love a beer. Thank you. Looks much better IRL. This is, like, I appreciate the excuse being posted, but this is kind of an assumed factor in the Storm Report. I, I'm just going to say it again. I've said it a billion times. I'm just going to say it one more time. Thank you so much. Taking pictures of models is as hard or harder than painting them in the first place. Dark heart, good timing. Mm. Ooh, and it's cold. Ooh, and it's cold. How wonderful. Remember the day he asked me what drink he should have for his 21st? Yeah, we went out for his 21st birthday. Wait, Greg, did you go with us? I don't remember if you were with us. Um... That was that was an interesting day. We went out we went out for playing Win's 21st birthday. Let me go ahead and put up his actual work here. Uh, enjoying painting MCP. Last few games have been invested enough to paint. They've all been rank and file. Only so many brothers of the Night's Watch or Decon Spearman one can paint before they grow weary. That's what I like about MCP as well, is that it lets you paint a lot of characters and you can focus on them one at a time. MPC model MCP models can be done in an evening and quickly provide a feeling of progress. It actually worked pretty nicely. Wish I had submitted fast enough. Forgot to show you the Black Panther Marvel's Cry Marvel Crisis Protocol you painted. <gasps> if you wait a few minutes, Dr. Rhino, you can have it as the first entry in the next Storm Report. That has to be worth something. Um, But yeah, we went out. We went out for Play and Win's uh, 21st birthday. And it was just such a surreal experience for me. Because here I am thinking, like, I am a young man. And there are these dudes, it was uh, him and, uh, you remember you remember Malacone and such, Greg, and uh, a number of other people were there. And they were all, like, looking to me, like, what, what, should, uh, what, what should I drink with this meal that I'm having? And I'm like, do you think I'm, like, some classy motherfucker who, like, if, if, it, if it's red meat, get a red wine. If you're eating chicken or fish, get a white wine. What do you... Get, get, you, get yourself a whiskey sour. Just, just, just drink stuff, man. Just try something until you find something you like. Yeah, Mr. Redbird, right. It was it was an interesting time. It was a lot of fun, though. Um, playing wins a fucking awesome guy. Really. I've made a lot of friends in a lot of places over the course of my life. And I would say confidently that... Four of the best friends I've ever had in my life are in this chat 
Not necessarily right now, because Play and Win is on that list. But are in this chat regularly. Um, I think three of them are in this chat right now. I am, I am incredibly blessed to be friends with these fine individuals. This came out pretty nice. I dig the, 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 the just bare metal look that you've gone with here. I appreciate that you made the under parts actually kind of a higher silver, and then the upper parts more of that dark gun metal. I think it would be tempting to go the other way around, but I think this makes it look much more intentional and less like just a wash and done. This is, uh, this is actually pretty cool looking. I don't know that I've seen anybody else do Iron Man in his classic monochromatic colors. I went for the, the, the more yellow, the more gold than they have on the later suits. I think it was like Mark VI or something like that. But yeah, this came out wonderful. Play and win. Play and win. Keep up the fucking good work, dude. And uh, yeah, if you're doing these like in an evening or getting them done regularly, please, 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 please continue to share right here on the Storm Report. I absolutely love seeing your paint progress, man. I have had the the distinct honor of being present for, I, I think, I don't know if Play and Win painted anything before us, Greg. I, like he might have, but I don't know that he did. But, but you and I have had the distinct honor and pleasure of, of advising him and being present for most of the things that he has painted. And I'm always happy when I hear that he has painted something and had a good time doing it. So play and win. Thank you so much for sharing. And please, please, please continue on your paint journey. Here we have from Darkheart, found this cipher, Fallen Dark Angel Champion. Ooh. Well, that's a class. Whoa. Somebody made his robes out of actual cloth. Is this one of the models that you got, Darkheart? Ooh, this is ooh. This is making me feel like I'm back in the 90s again. This is this is a technique that has not been used much or at all. <laughs> and yeah, a real chain, like a little jewelry chain around his around his waist there. Oh man. Sometimes I forget what it was like before we had 3D printers or or ready access to bits. There was a time there was a time when the bits box was the most precious thing that you could find at your FLGS. When it was not as easy to, like, it wasn't as easy to even, like, go online and find the particular bits that you wanted. You just had to make do with what you had. And sometimes that meant taking actual fabric and gluing it to your model in order to be a robe because you needed some fucking heretical dark angels. This is a cool find, Dark Heart. <laughs> We do not speak of those times. Those were dark times. Before the printer. Darkheart, I would almost... I, I don't know what you plan on doing with this mini. I would almost encourage you to keep this exactly how it is. I got a question for you, Darkheart. You said you recently came into some minis. Um... Do me a favor when you get a minute. Ping me on Discord. Give me a general breakdown of how many minis you got and, and what they're from. And let me know if there is a particular faction of Warhammer 40k that you would like to paint. Not promising anything, but maybe, maybe we could do something about that. Very nice. And thank you for sharing this little this little piece of history with us. This is pretty great. Yeah, I would just keep this how it is, as like an artifact. The original owner doesn't have it anymore, but some part of me is pleased that it still exists. Very cool. Here we have from Roland working a little bit more on the vulture. Ooh, this is actually coming together nicely. Yeah, that cockpit looks good. That's a decent looking vulture you got here, Roland. Custom cloth robe, but undrilled barrels. The 90s were a weird time for Gatorung. They were a very weird time. A lot of people didn't... Like, okay, he might have had some linen lying around from something, but he didn't necessarily have a pin vice. Speaking of which, I just went in on a... I need to, I need to put it up on the Discord. There is a Kickstarter right now for a teeny tiny little hand drill with pin vice size drill bits that is battery powered. You just like click it and turn it on, do a little bit of drilling. And I went ahead and went in on, I think a pair of them. Uh, I need to post the Kickstarter up in Discord because it actually seems like a good product. Should I do something on the nose to break up that large area of green? If 
I were gonna do anything to the nose, because I see what you mean here, this this big spot of green on the nose of the of the vulture. Uh, I agree with Vergata Run, paint the nose turret the black of the gun barrels. Yeah, this down here is is going to help right away. Are you interested in trying a new technique, Roland? Are you interested in adding something to your toolbox? Because if you are, you should consider trying a little bit of sponge weathering. And what I mean by that is take, um, like a rust red, almost orange, because it's going to dry darker than it is wet, and it's going against green, but like a rust red or an orange color and take a sponge. And when I say a sponge, I don't mean like a sponge you would use in your kitchen. Um, if you buy uh, clamshell packed minis, you might have some of the, they, they pack it with these little sheets of sp open cell sponge-like material. You might have some of that. Failing that, the same sponge-like material is what you can find on these foam chip brushes, which you can get a whole bunch of these almost anywhere. Take a little piece of, of this stuff, rip it off, kind of bunch it up in your fingers, like so. Dip it in the paint, dab it on a um, paper towel to get a lot of it off, and then just go in and go bat, 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 and stipple it. Just very lightly, just a few times. Da, da, da. And you'll get a nice random wear pattern. And if you do it, like, kind of heavily once, in like a rust brown orange color and then come in again and do it very very lightly in those same areas with a black you're gonna get a very natural worn weathered kind of like it got hit there look like some of the metal is exposed and is maybe rusting a little bit I think it would look really good it'd be a good way to break up the big expanse of green you're talking about and it would add another tool to your painting toolbox, which I think is always a good thing to explore. Uh, you might not get it perfectly right the first time. It's the sort of thing that just kind of takes practice, and um, you know, you kind of do it to, to, to taste. So I would say take a spare piece of plastic and, and test it out first. And always remember that less is more. It's easy to add paint. It's very hard to take paint off. So just do it real lightly in a few small spots, and I think you will really, really like the results. That's my thought, Roland, if you're interested. Other than that, I'm really liking the, the, the paint job so far. Red pinstripe, this is also an option. Airflax is not wrong. Oh, here we have from Cyber Knight. Pulled the airbrush out today, and this is everything that passed over the table. Vallejo Mecha mats, varnish on the hills, and test tower. Two shades of gray on some Trinity City buildings, and some Vallejo deep sky on some Delta base that ended up more translucent than expected, so now I need to decide between a third coat of that or just hitting it up with a brush on coat of Cantor Blue. Those hills really do look good. A little bit of varnish helps for sure. I'm happy to see some Delta Base getting painted too. These little slum towers, oh, aren't they cute? It looks, now it's hard to tell from this distance, but it looks it doesn't look particularly translucent, but obviously you would know more having it in your hands. Um, I feel like if you put that in front of me and asked me what I was going to do, I feel like dry brushing would be my next step. Because you can bring... It's a, even if it is translucent, it's a very, very dark blue. And uh, you can come up from that with some dry brushing very, very easily. By the way, it's damn, damn good to see some terrain getting done. By the way, I noticed, Cyber Knight, I noticed that uh, you've been taking... Yeah, I think the blue looks good. I agree with Von Jankman. Uh, that you, you've been taking some of your product pictures next to uh, Trinity City Buildings, and all I can say is thank you. I'm honored. That's, that's really fucking cool. It makes me feel legitimate, which is a, a feeling that I try to chase. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know, Magnatorius Maximus, our very own Cyber Knight, is also the proprietor of uh, Metalcore Collectibles, a site that you should absolutely take a look at if you are into 6mm at all. I think uh, Steel Warrior, Alex over Steel Warrior, said on Discord earlier that like compared to the single pose models that CGL produces, uh, Metalcore Collectibles makes something much more akin to like complex multi-pose model kits of really, really detailed mechs and vehicles. Uh, a fantastic array of vehicles with a huge number of options. Definitely go check out Metalcore Collectibles if you play Battletech at all, or really any 6mm based uh, sci-fi or modern war game. 
Well, White Wolf, uh, add it to the add, add it to the list of things that I need to have a a command for. <laughs> Here we have from Zombie Brush Studios, classic Necromancer in the classic style. This is nice. This is nice. Mm-mm-mm. That monochrome with just the green. Just the green to bring it out. These little splashes of color. I love, I love the basic. It seems like the silliest thing to focus on but I love the basing on this. Yeah, exactly, Vergatarung. Even black grass and these little bits of, like, white snow, and it's very subtle, it's very understated. It's almost more... The, the, the quality of this paint job is, is, is kind of... And, I mean, it seems obvious when you're talking about a monochromatic paint job, but it's like the quality is in what isn't there, what hasn't been done. And I, I want to point some things out, and uh, th this is not to, in no way is this a criticism of the paint job, because I love this paint job, but I'd like to point out that there are things on here you won't even notice, because you're so taken in by the focal points and the overall quality. First of all, the skull grabs your eye. Because there is a lovely amount of effort put into the shape of the hand, and then the upper surfaces of the skull where the light catches it. The face grabs your eye. The shapes are, are very, very well defined, and there's the green eye staring at you that you just can't look away from. The frill around the neck, very simple. There's not a lot of effort put in up here, because there doesn't need to be. This is just a framing device for the face, which is the focal point. This is a good lesson in how to not put too much time and effort into something that isn't really going to contribute to the overall look of the model. It's just a simple boop, 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 quick highlight. And it doesn't need to be any more than that. In fact, any more than that would start to detract, would start to draw your eye away from the amazingly done face, which should be the focal point. So we got one, two, and then we're drawing up here. This extra little bit of green, and these very, very well highlighted stark white skulls, and such sharp contrast to the dark wood of the staff, which again is, is very, very lightly, very subtly highlighted. Not a lot going on here. Most of what you're getting from here is just the darkness. Just the color and the shape. But then the effort's gone into the skulls and this little bit of green right here. This is... This is lovely. This is... This is a lesson in miniature composition. And, uh, like, I, I wish that I was better at it. I think I'm better at identifying it and pointing it out on other people's work than I am at really replicating it myself. Uh, I love seeing Zombie Brush's work. He always does a fantastic job. I, you might have outdone yourself with this one. Sometimes these models sneak up on us. I was talking about this last time. Sometimes we're like, I paint models and I paint them up to a certain standard and it's all well and good. And then every now and then, something comes along that's just like, and then you outdid yourself on accident. And, whew. He does. He does all sorts of stuff like this, but this is one of the best that I've seen him do. It's simple, it's understated, it's effective, and it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. This is a beautiful model. Zombie Breast Studios, this is a work of art. <sighs> it's just very pleasing to look at. Guys, if you're not following Zombie Breast Studios, go give this man a follow. Because this, this is his bread and butter. Fantastic. Oh, wow. I was really expecting lyrics to come into the song because I know it, and they just didn't. They kind of freaked me out for a second. It is Dr. Rhino. Wife just surprised me by laminating my handmade... Oh, lam laminating my handmade deck of many things. I thought you were going to say she surprised you by laminating your hand. Which, uh... Yeah, that would be... That would indeed be shocking. Here we have from Darkheart. Can't wait till these come in. Oh, did you order yourself some, uh... You gonna do some Thousand Suns? Chaos Terminators? Hmm, Dark Heart. A man of culture and taste. The Thousand Suns are among, among my absolute favorites of Chaos Legion's Kitchen Sink. It took me a second. I was about to say Kitchen Kink, which I think has totally different connotations. Thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the Storm Chasers. It does look like a Skeksy. 
No. Alpha Legion. Puh, 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 puh. That's what I had to say about your Alpha Legion. Absolutely, welcome in. Yeah, these are uh, these are nice. I like the the kind of like Nile crocodile one right here. And I appreciate that he managed to do an Anubis head that doesn't just look like another copy of the the fucking what's it's from Stargate. For that matter, same for the uh, would that be Osiris. These are very very cool. Darkheart, what you're gonna do these as Black Legion? Horus, yes, thank you. You're gonna paint the Egyptian styled one as Black Legion? Are you out of your mind? <laughs> what? This is blasphemy. Sons of Horus. Okay, okay. Jaffa Cree. I I'm not gonna argue with you, Darkheart. I'm not gonna argue with you. I'm just gonna say that when I look at these, I want them to be either Thousand Suns original Crimson. Or Thousand Suns, uh, later on, all is dust, mummy, blue, and yellow. But that's me. And the beautiful thing about this hobby is that, uh, this is about what you want to do. So now I'm very, very curious as to your plans, and I hope, I hope, that you share them with us as you continue to work. Here we have from White Wolf calling it Therapy Thursday, even though Canada Post isn't exactly making it therapeutic since I won't get it until Tuesday. Stupid stat days, but got this resin conversion kit on the way. Mwaha. Ha ha ha. Ha ha. Oof. Lots of little bits in there, huh? It makes the Zaku look almost practical, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> Black Legion somehow have more Zinch Thousand Suns than the Thousand Suns have. Well, I mean, Black Legion has everybody, though, to be fair. That's the point of the Black Legion, is that they're, you know, Chaos Unbound, United. It's, uh, like, his, his gun even gets a little bit more practical and realistic in this version, doesn't it? I kind of like the little... Is there, like, a cut-in on the head? That's kind of neat. An interesting kit. White Wolf, you build so many kits. So many kits. Here we have from Mellow Minis. Oh, this is the ogre you were talking about. Yeah, the reflection on the scope is pretty sweet. Is I think that might just be an actual piece of reflective material. Same for the eye, but I'm not sure. Oh, and this is the Artisan's Guild ogre that Mellow Minis has been working on. Ooh, 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 I love those uh, real deep, ruddy skin tones. Of course, the model itself is fantastic. He's, he's wielding a ship's cannon as if it's a hand cannon. He's got some some rope lashed around the front there, cause he's in he's like a pirate ogre. Why the hell not? Yeah, the face, right? He looks like he's having a fucking party. I love the big chisel-like teeth sticking up out of his jaw, looking like a traffic jam. Most of them are jewel inserts. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what they look like. Well, Mellow Minis, thank you for sharing this with us, and thank you by the way, Mellow Minis, for the raid. I really appreciate it, dude. Guys, if you're not following Mellow Minis. You really should be. I've been in for a couple of his streams. He's a very, very cool dude. Uh, I think relatively fresh to streaming, but picking it up very quickly. And uh, very welcoming, always willing to talk about what he is doing. Very community-oriented, which is obviously something that I like quite well. I want these shells. I feel like he's got, like, like Koopa shells on his arms, and I see them, and I just want them to be blue. I want them to be blue spiky shells. Mellow Minis, make me happy and make them blue spiky shells. <laughs> Like, like those horrid Koopa shells that you can't get away from. It would also kind of nicely repeat the blue of his, uh, his little sock hat that he's got going on there. You don't have to. You don't have to do what I want. It would just be cool. Thank you for the reminder, Darkheart. Or red and white. Yeah, that could work, too. Oh, God. Didn't even have to fix my pillow this time, but I do need to sit up and stop slouching like a fucking goon. Ooh, lovely work, Mellow Minis. Here we have from Chaotic Harmony made some pretty dirt with Kursala's flocking. Ooh, these are... Woof! Okay. It's always interesting to me to, to comment on Chaotic Harmony's work because... We've seen him come so far in the last year of painting. And he's been doing a lot more of it lately. 
and I always say this every time we get to it. I'm, I'm, I'm almost tempted, I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to be like, oh my god, this is such a huge improvement, because it kind of implies that it wasn't good before, but I think it's fair to say this is the best base job that I have seen Catac Harmony do. It has a wonderful mixture of different grits that kind of give it scale. Mixing in the tufts. Mixing in the flocking from, uh... From Rainy River Designs. Speaking of which, if you're interested in some of this flocking that he is applying here from our very own Kursala. Made this stuff on a whim and I like seeing how much Chaotic is using it. Yeah, he really shows off how versatile it can be. And I haven't done much basing since I got some of your basing material, which is, you know, not the most helpful thing. But guys, if you're interested in getting some of this very fine basing material, um, hit exclamation point... Merch? Rainy River? What did I do? There's one that'll give you a link over to Rainy River Designs. Did I do Rainy River? What did I do? No, I did Steel Warrior. Merch. That's the one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm such a terrible streamer. <laughs> what commands do I have again? Which one does what? God damn it. All right, all right, all right. I'm going to do Metalcore and Rainy River tonight so that we can have some easy links for those. But yeah, merch will get you there. Go ahead and click that link that the Thunderbot just dropped. That'll take you into specifically the Thunderhead Studio merch store section of Rainy River. But from there, you can navigate over to uh, the paints, flocking, and other items that they have available over there. Buy my stuff, but find it yourself. <laughs> really fantastic work, Cat. Like, this is the best basing you've done, and I'm very excited to see what minis wind up on this. Here we have from Sheza, slowly making a skull base for Hella. It seems... Fitting. Ah, <laughs> the classic balled up tinfoil substrate. This is a great way to sculpt, by the way, if you guys are doing stuff with just putty. Uh, taking like aluminum foil and balling it up and making the general shape of what you want and then covering it with putty and then sculpting the details on it. It's a fantastic way to get a lot of bulk without wasting a whole lot of material. Uh, and of course then gluing down uh, a bunch of fairly expensive Games Workshop skulls on top of that. But yes, it does seem appropriate for Hella for her to have a bunch of skulls on her base. Now, Sheza, the real trick is going to be, can you make their eyes glow green like the dead of Asgard? Because that'd be pretty cool. It'd be pretty damn cool. Sheza, I hope to see that as you continue to work on it. Here we have from NB Toby, Hollow Resin printed wall disaster is coming along. Almost have a complete wall. They seem to have stopped exploding after I cured them. Battle effects for an abandoned military base taken over by pirates. I think it's the water washable resin, and I say this because I've had similar issues, but I only had it after I switched to water washable. With the cracks forming, no matter how well you vent them, I don't know what it is, the water washable just doesn't do well as a hollow shell. It works pretty well from up top. And yeah, as long as they cure solid, none of this should really be that much of a problem for gameplay, and then these areas where they just didn't print for whatever reason actually do look like some pretty badass battle damage. These walls that are being printed. Uh, these are designed for FDM, but NB Toby has been doing them in uh, in resin, because he's, you know, a bit of a madman. These walls are available for free, by the way, if they interest you. Uh, they work for hexed or hexless. They will fit in hexes, they will move between hexes across the flats or across some of the diagonals. It's really a pretty complete wall set. It has these little soft locking tabs so that you can hook them together so that they don't jangle apart on your tabletop. And you can find these for free on Thingiverse if you check out my profile. Uh, the whole set. Also, if you go to Steel Warrior Studios, which there is a link for, hit exclamation point Steel Warrior. I think that works. That will take you over to Steel Warrior Studios where you can find our free STL sample pack, including this entire set of walls with gates and splits and towers and all kinds of fun stuff. You're not wrong, Vergata. I have a box of those skulls myself. I just use them sparingly because they're expensive. They're excellent skulls, though. They're really, really well made. Ha <laughs> ha! That one worked. What do you know? Well, nicely printed, NB Toby, and I can't wait to see what you wind up doing with all the cracks and battle damage. I think it's going to look awesome. Next, prints will be printed out hollowed by hand in Tinkercad with no bottom to allow for better and more even curing. Yeah, that makes sense. If there's no bottom on it at all, because what do you need the bottom for, ultimately? It's not doing any good. Again, these were originally made with FDM printing in mind, so that wasn't really taken into consideration. I hope, to, I hope that the next batch comes out better for you. Here we have from Roland, Reuben Pizza, Rye Dough, Thousand Island Dressing Sauce, Corned Beef, Kraut, and Swiss. 
My mouth literally just started watering. Like it wasn't before, and now... Ooh. Yeah, I get that too, Forgot Aranga. It, look, it looks like a little soggy. It looks like maybe eat it with a fork? But I would happily do that. Yeah, how was it? This, this is the question. Roland, ultimately, it's hard to judge from the look. Was it good? I'm gonna bet it was. Oh, yeah, I'd eat that whole goddamn thing to square. <laughs> like, without question. Oh. Oh, man. Yeah. I wonder what's for dinner. So, from Darkheart, painted during the stream. No shit. Working on some, some Iron Warriors Chaos Space Marines. This is wonderful. This is a wonderful thing for me to see from any new painter. So many of us... It's funny to me because this is actually where I started. Darkheart. I was just talking earlier about how I got started painting. The time when I got uh, really, really started back when uh, my friends and I were playing Dawn of War and we first were like, okay, let's buy some models. Um, the first models that I bought were some Iron Warriors, and then I started painting Iron Warriors. So really, I guess the first models I painted were Iron Warriors, Chaos Space Marines. And then, after that, it was Tau. Tau were new at the time, and I was like, I gotta, I want to start a new army that isn't secondhand from somebody, and I got Tau, and I fell in love with the Crute, and I painted a bunch of those. Gotta paint up the Iron Warriors custom kill team, but fuck yeah, Iron Within, Iron Without. I fucking love the Iron Warriors. They're a great, a great Chaos Space Marine Legion. Well, this is looking this is looking pretty solid for uh for some first paint jobs that you're getting done, Darkheart. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get you a nice array of paints for you to try a number of brands and decide what you like without making you break the bank trying just a little bit of everything. And we'll put go ahead and put a sable brush in your hand so that you can have uh, something with a nice point on it. Get in there and do the real fine work. You'll be you'll be lensing those eyes in no time at all. Very nicely done, Darkheart, and thank you for sharing. Here we have from Greg the Salt Miner. April painting challenge teaser. That's right, because you stayed long enough to get to the storm before you get a sneak peek at the theme or challenge for April. Full details will come with Thunderhead's next stream. This is not my work, but graciously stolen from our mini painting on Reddit, painted by you, DG Scott. Can you guess what the theme slash challenge will be? <gasps> it's gonna be Castlevania. The theme, the theme's gonna be bats. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not gonna guess because I know, because I know what the challenge is. So me guessing is silly and pointless, and it's not even a guess. It's just me saying it. But you guys can guess. Not exactly, Riot Sister. I mean, yes, but a specific refinement of that idea. Picked this theme way before I knew about Curse City, by the way. First of all, this is a fantastic paint job that he did. And, uh, yeah, the technique at, you, at, in, at work here is just a useful one to study when you're, when you're painting minis as far as the direction of light on a mini and how that affects shading. Yeah, the challenges are built on teaching fundamentals, not flashy techniques like OSL. And yeah, no, that's that's true. OSL would be if he had something in his hand. If, if he had, like, a fireball in his hand, and the fireball was casting light on him, that would be OSL. It's object source lighting. The light is sourced from an object. In this case, it looks more like the lighting is coming from something nearby... Or maybe a sunset. Fire smoke, that's painted. That's not red light. That that light is painted onto him. The only lighting on this mini is, is cold and coming from above. Actually, he has two light sources. Yes, he has from above, and then he has from below. They're, they're opposing light sources. Moonlight and the red ground reflected light. Yeah, I get... You know what I get from him is almost like um, a twilight... Not the book almost like a twilight lighting where you have the sun set on one side and like the new moon on the other that's what I see when I look at him because it's a very red kind of sunsetish, like the fading light you know also thematic but yes it's going to be uh, ambient lighting as I understand it, which I'm very I, I, th I think that's that, that's a cool idea that's something I'm looking forward to kind of digging into 
But yes, OSL would be if he had an actual object on him that was supposed to be casting light. Atmospheric lighting, thank you. Ooh, here we have the second picture from Dark Hearts. Oh yeah, much more detailed shot up close. Hey man, getting those fundamentals down. This is where I turn into an asshole and say that object just to the side of the mini is still not Shut up, Daedron. <laughs> you with your technically correct, the very best kind of correct. Put a picture in the work in progress channel. I'll have to I'll have to, I'll have to check it out for your Iron Warriors. Nice. Well. Uh, honestly, this is probably better than the first few that I did, I gotta say. Um, if, if I were gonna make changes to this, Dark Heart, if, if I were gonna do it, I would restrict my um, caution striping a little bit on the bolter, make like the magazine in standard metal and like the foregrip and everything, because there's this little line on the bolter where there's cowling. It tends to end, like, right here. And in, then back here is more like the, the working part of the bolter. So, like, if this was done in gunmetal with a wash on it, and then you did the hazard striping, like, just here. Hazard striping is a funny sort of thing. Less can be more. You want to be more suggestive of it than anything else. So, yeah, if I were to, if I were to cut a little box, like, which is about the edge of the cowling, I would make all this just sort of gunmetal, maybe like a warm gunmetal, and then have the hazard striping right here. But man, you're moving in the right direction. I can also say it looks like, I'm not sure, I think you did this in the right order. You definitely want to put down yellow first and then black over top of it, because black goes over yellow much easier than yellow is going to go over black. Yeah, a wash uh, on the metallic parts. Even if all you did was add a black wash to these silver parts here, and then maybe another one on the shoulder just right up to the gold, it would help you kind of clean this up a little bit. You actually alternate it. Okay, so what you want to do, generally, when you're doing hazard striping, paint the whole thing yellow, and then carefully do the striping in black. Because black goes over yellow a whole lot easier than yellow goes over black. Yellow basically doesn't go over black. Like, that's, <laughs> it just doesn't work. It can, probably isn't going to. If you, um, and this is just going to be like a brush control thing as you get practice, and, um... Model was primed black. Okay. Sometimes what I'll do if I'm going to be putting down a light color like yellow is I'll take a decently thick white. If, I, if, I'm, if the model's primed black, I'll take a decently thick white and put it down before I put down the yellow. Give your yellow a base to kind of work with. Yellow, is, you're going to discover yellow is one of those colors that's just kind of difficult to paint. Yellow drives everybody crazy. Something to do with the, the, the particular pigments that go into yellow paint. It's very, very difficult to lay down over almost anything else. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a good point, too. If you want to get really advanced, undercoating in pink is a good idea. But undercoating in brown is surprisingly good, too. Uh, you can start with a fairly deep brown, surprisingly, like like almost an umber brown, and then build it up into a gold and then a yellow on top of that. But yeah, I would, personally, what I would do is, um, and actually, I think that's a better idea. I think it's a better idea, Datron, than putting down white, like I was saying. If you paint the, the whole area that's going to be hazard striped in a brown color, and then paint your yellow on top of it, and then stripe it with black, what you're going to get is a much more vivid yellow out of it, because this yellow is a little bit washed out, a little canary yellow, but you can get more of a gold yellow out of it that way. Xandri Dustin, Avalon Sunset work, well, yeah. Finished Marinas in Miniature General, I will check it out after the stream. Yeah, uh, I, you will find, though, Darkheart, um, if, if you're asking questions on, on the Thunderhead Discord, um, you're going to get a lot of good answers. We have some very, very talented painters who hang out in the Discord. And uh, it's, it's fucking exciting to see you get into painting, man. Yeah. You're going to be, you're going to be looking, save, uh, like really, particularly now that you're starting. And I know I said this earlier, but any, any mini that you're doing right now, like, save them. Don't necessarily go back and redo them. Just kind of keep painting, keep moving forward, and save the ones that you've done. Because it is going to be awesome in like a year or two for you to have these to go back and look at. You are absolutely going to want to be able to go back and look at where you started. Ooh, 
Ooh, we got a decal on him and everything. That's pretty sweet. Nicely done. That decal actually looks like it came out pretty decently. Yeah, you're going to want to work on thinning your paint a little bit more, too, because I can tell there's a little bit of texture on this black from where it chunked up a little bit. Thinning your paint is just something that's going to come with practice. Just going to come with a little bit of practice. You have to get a feel for it, and everybody kind of likes it to be at a, at a different a different level. Yeah, and definitely uh, start picking up and learning washes as well, because like a black wash over the silver would go really well, like a dark brown wash over the leather pouches would go really well, something like a sepia wash over the gold would help to give it some depth. Testing a wet palette. Wet palettes are, are, are definitely potentially useful. Um, there's nothing wrong with getting used to using one early. You're, you're, you're probably going to want one down the road. Well, thank you for sharing with us today, Dark Heart. And I hope that you're having fun. That's the most important thing. If you're having fun painting your minis and you want to continue to get better, this is, this is the perfect fucking place to be, the perfect mindset for a new painter. And I really appreciate you sharing this with us, man. Here we have from Manro Fasal. How is my blend coming? Pretty good up in the forehead. Pretty good on this cheek and even in the chin. There's a little bit of a stark transition here on this cheek going up into the nose. I think the blend coming down off the nose into this little shadow of the eye actually works really nicely. Oh, Darkheart, I, 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 it, you can never tell how much time I'm going to spend on any given entry <laughs> in the Storm Report. Some of them I'm going to be like, hey, good job. And other ones I'm going to talk about for like half an hour. Watch makeup contouring videos. Yes. Riot Sister, that's fantastic advice, and it's some advice that I need to follow more myself. Because you realize that there are a lot of makeup contouring videos on YouTube. It's a whole thing. It's a whole industry. And those are people that have spent a lot of time learning how to basically paint a face on top of a face. That's a lot of what makeup is. It's, it's taking the features that are already there and accentuating them in a way that looks good to the human eye. And that is precisely what we're trying to do when we paint these. It does, it comes off a little, a little bit chunky with the transitions, particularly in the cheeks. And I feel like maybe you would have it brighter almost up to the hairline. I'm not really sure. I can tell you that the coloration is, is nice for being drow skin. But yeah, I would definitely consult with some makeup contouring videos. I think Riot Sister is giving the best advice here. Was trying to brush blending. This is a technique that I myself have not used very much, so it's difficult for me to give advice on it. I like the colors that you're using, and yeah, I just think the distribution of them could be addressed a little bit. You've picked out the most important parts for the most part. Your cheekbones, tip of the chin, tip of the nose, forehead. Be a little bit more in here. I don't know, it's hard to say. I wish I could give better advice, but I suck at painting faces, man, Rofasol. I definitely think Riot Sister's given the best advice, though. Check out some in the T-Zone. See, she already knows more <laughs> than I do about painting faces. This is my faces all look like shit. This is why. Riot Sister, teach me. Yeah, bright under the eyes. Like right here. Faces are all T's and cheeks. Down the nose and across the brow. That makes sense. Yeah, the T right here. I think you could also... This is one that I've learned. Hitting right here just a wee little bit above the eye but under the eyebrow actually does a surprising amount to sell the shape of the face. Not a lot. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. It's definitely coming along, though, man, about this all. I'm going to sneeze. Okay, I'm not going to sneeze. <laughs> Ruin that one. Here we have from The Hobby Habit. Painted during CavCon with you last weekend. Super motivational for a mere mortal like... Oh, come on, Hobby Habit. Come on, Hobby Habit. Imperator Coco. Ooh, this came out nice. Red and orange. I like this one. This is, yeah, this is the Imperator. Which is, I believe, a rack cav. See, that's the trick with so many of us, Riot Sister. We have all this knowledge shared between us. It's putting it together and manifesting it meaningfully that seems to be the real challenge. 
I like that you've dated the bottom of the base. That's actually pretty cool. Oh, this came out nice. It's a simple but effective paint job, and I really like the way you've kept your reds nice and deep and then separated that from this more kind of vivid orange-red and then worked in some kind of cool gray panels in there to break it up. Guns around the cockpit, on the back here, on the sides of the legs. It's rack, isn't it? I'm pretty sure the Imperator is a rack, Cav. I forget, because I know the Cavs can be used by everybody, so they just kind of show up in everybody's uh, different factions. Yeah, I agree, Sumitha. The, the trimmer on the cockpit. And this is an interesting departure from what I'll often do, where I use the glass as my focal point, but the glass on here is real subdued black. You have a little bit of these sort of textured glare lines, which I think work really well. And then we've just gone with a highly contrasting cool gray on the uh, sort of the struts and the surrounding area to create the focal points that are focusing on the glass. All in all, I agree, it's, it's a beautifully done thing. Needs to be a teeny beauty blender from mini slash bust faces that's not just a bristle, but yeah, like, ooh, maybe we can make a Kickstarter for this. Just teeny tiny little makeup brushes so that you can use actual makeup techniques on teeny tiny little faces. Genius. Genius. Really, really nicely done hobby habit. I, I, I don't know what to say, except this is a very simple and effective paint job, and this should go on the list of paint jobs that prove you don't have to do super complex techniques to have something that is visually striking and interesting and effective on the tabletop. Aren't those just dry brushing brushes at that point? Well, they'd have to be, like, really, really soft, though, and, and shaped. Do they forgot a room? Link me. Link me. Hobby Habit, thank you so much for sharing. Dude, you did a fantastic job on this. I, I, I love seeing calves in the Storm Report. We don't get enough calves around here, so thank you very much. Here we have from Gray Fox a few weapon model alts for the Interceptor. Gray Fox, who uh, has recently acquired an artist channel in uh, on Thunderhead Studios Discord, if you're interested in checking out his mecha work, uh, runs a Instagram called Heretic... Shit. It's not heretic shit. That's not it. It's something heretic? I feel like an idiot for not remembering the name that he uses. Heretic's Mysterium! That's the one! I knew it was it was some kind of magic-y word that I wasn't quite remembering. But yeah, it does some really, really cool mecha work. And a lot of really neat ideas, cool shapes, very, very evocative and aggressive. Really like that, that latest one that you posted, Gray Fox, the one with the wheels on the ends of the arms. I think that's that's one of the coolest designs I've seen of yours to date. I like this one. Something about the square barrel really gets me. I like how each of these uh, ballistic barrels have these little, like, uh, sort of recoil compensators built in. Sort of a little targeting apparatus here. That's pretty... Oh, it folds down. I see. This part here folds up and goes right there. Ah, that's neat. That's neat. And you work entirely in Blender, eh, Gray Fox? You do some really good work. Here we have from Sumitha, Operation Lancaster Thunderhead exclusive preview. It has been mentioned a number of times that the Dreadnought Battle Corps has a bit of a bone to pick with the word of Blake, like so many others. Dreadnought and their allies lost a lot of friends and loved ones to the religious zealots during the Jihad. Well... While there are plenty of other reasons for Dreadnought to dislike the Word of Blake, the nuclear destruction of the entire population of a world under the Dreadnought banner, in the end resulting in the effective annihilation of all human life in an entire star system, well, let's just say that such a thing is not forgotten quickly, if ever. This event was collectively known as Trinity's Fall, the name for this event being reference to the destruction of the DBC Trinity, a Blackwater warship responsible for defending the world. Just four weeks before the total loss of population on the surface, while a number of the military-grade hardened buildings may still be standing between detonation areas here, none survived. Of course, as a handful of people know, there's so much more to, t to these events than uh, as it first seems. It is an interesting series of stories. Matt Plog making this frozen hell turn nuclear detonation scarred frozen hell look amazing. Oh, this is nice. I, I haven't seen this one before. I like all the cracked earth around the craters. Just brutalized. Yeah, well, the, some of the buildings survived, technically, technically speaking. But based on these craters, yeah, I would imagine you wouldn't want to be anywhere near this place. I like the little building designs in here. There's so much detail worked into such a small portion of it, and the scale is really sold. Because if this was just 
some craters, you'd have a hard time telling how big things are supposed to be, but then your eye is drawn to, like, a building that you generally recognize the size of, and you're like, oh, shit, okay, yeah. Plog, as always, pretty damned excellent work. I always love seeing some new stuff from Matt Plog. Like I said above, such a thing is not forgotten quickly, if ever. Just 18 months later, Operation Lancaster was launched, headed by Dreadnought's only other warship, the DBC Phoenix. Admittedly, while Operation Lancaster may as well be compared to the Doolittle Raid of World War II for the amount of damage to the word of Blake it was expected to accomplish, basically a moral victory at best with a bit of hippity hoppity don't you fucking dare step on my property. The actual outcome of this effort would result in far-reaching long-term impacts far beyond anything anyone could have expected. This small fleet of ships and all of the troops aboard them have no idea the level of hell they were about to enter. Matt Plog once again, working his magic. We have the ships. We have the weapons. What we need are soldiers. Do your part and join the mobile infantry today. No? Nobody? <laughs> Thank you, Sumatha. <laughs> I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part, too. <laughs> it's just immediately the feeling that this gave me. He does such amazing hard surface stuff. I like all the texture that he's given to the surrounding space, too. Very cool. And they're flying kites, isn't that cute? Exactly, Hobby Habit. Absolutely. Look at them. Heading in. Closing for the kill. Well, they hope they would, anyway. The folding solar sail. Yeah, I thought so, too. Yeah, that's... Flying kites. But yeah, you can see them folding up and being drawn in. Very, very cool work, and thank you, as always, for sharing these amazing images that you've commissioned from Matt Plog with us, Sumitha. And we have from Greg the Salt Miner. <gasps> Package from Green Stuff World. Oh my god, super. Oh, wait. Pure metal. Gold, antique gold, copper, bronze. Spider string? I'm not familiar with these products at all. Oh, they're, they're metal pigments. Oh. Interest. I will be very curious to see how this works out for you. I haven't even. I haven't even thought of using just metal pigments. And the spider serum is airbrushed cobweb. All right, I'm gonna have to see examples of this because that's strange sounding, to say the least. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, please do post examples once you've got some of this stuff put down, Greg. Damn. Hey, Puck Duncher, how you doing? I see you there in chat. Uh, also been working real hard on my own 3D terrain. I've always hated buildings slash ruin ruins just sitting on neoprene mats, so I've worked, I'm working on a line of hills and cliffs that include a standardized foundation to put all kinds of buildings and other terrain features on top of. I like this idea. Just to give it a little bit more, a little bit more depth, give the land some shape in addition. Because, I, because I agree, when you have a neoprene mat and just terrain, you know, buildings chunk, 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 stuck on top of it, then you assume all the the contour of the terrain. It's all sort of in the art. But this will give it some more depth. Yeah, I think this is a very, very cool idea. Heavily inspired by some of the Frontier Defense maps from Titanfall 2. <laughs> Nobody ever does that. Certainly somebody didn't release a whole expansion for a line of 3D Battletech terrain that was based on, like, two buildings from Angel City. That sounds crazy. That, that's, a, that's a wild thing that no one would ever do. <clears throat> yes. These prints did come out quite nice. Also, Greg, um, ZBrush tomorrow or Saturday? We, we wanted to do ZBrush Fridays. If you're available tomorrow, let's do ZBrush Fridays. Because I'm down. Let's, let's just get back on track, because I want to do that weekly. Either works. All right, let's make it tomorrow. Here we have from Gray Fox some variants. Yeah, I like these ones. The wheelie mechs, these are cool. They they scratch kind of like a cyberpunk itch or something. Oh, I see where the weapons mount on the sides, kind of up at this angle. Like, you've done a number of mecha designs, Gray Fox. I think this is the most unique and interesting so far. This is very cool. Like, it's, it's both simple and effective. Makes me think a bit of Cowboy Bebop. Yeah, I could see that, Simitha. 
And I noticed you, you've done this a few times where you got your missile launchers just sort of integrated linearly into limbs. That's that's a really interesting idea, as opposed to sort of tacking them on the front. Ghost in the shell, even? Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. I don't think we're going to stream ZBrush Drakari. Um, I could probably stream some fusion or something. I get so self-conscious about my design workflow, though. I'm like... People are gonna know that I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Look like a like a. I can't talk, like at all. Look like they could turn on a dime. I agree. Yeah, they could just spin right in place, huh? Yeah, that's something that we were thinking about doing. Um, now, there's this new uh, form of streaming that they have on Discord where you can have, like, one primary person streaming and other people can only, like, talk or involve themselves if they're sort of, like, approved. They don't have it for video streaming yet, but that is a feature that I could see being used in the near future for exactly that sort of stream, where we're doing some design work and uh, people could sort of stop in and you could ask questions and it could just be, like, me and Greg working on stuff. I don't, I don't know. Um, they're going to continue to expand that feature and we'll probably make use of it. We'll probably make use of it. But with that, that brings us to the end of the Storm Report and thus, you guessed it, to the end of the stream. Who are we raiding? Who's, who's streaming? Who's doing what? Community design stream? That does sound like it could be a good time. Could be a good time. Who is... Oh, let's raid Critical Role! No, no, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Thunderdome Drew is up and painting. Who else is going? Thunderdome Drew, Casual Joker, Megapedia, Zombie Brush is going. Altered Man Art. Ooh, we don't get to. Oh no! Why are there so many cool people streaming? Chaotic is painting. Heresy Killer is painting. Altered Man is painting. Zombies painting. Okay, 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 okay. I'm gonna give you a choice between my two top picks. All right, you can choose black and white painting or oil painting. Or you can vote for Chaotic. Yeah, I know Thunderdome Drew's up, too. This is a tough choice. This is a very tough choice. Are you going, Thick Mike? Yeah, there you are. You're playing Apex Legends. Walter's Workshop just wanted to pipe in, because he's been lurking a good long while, and say, thanks for the stream. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Vote oil because I'm learning. Here's the thing. We never, ever, we've raided Altered Man one time, and he is a truly, truly phenomenal painter. So I'd like to send you guys over to him. Even if you're not going to stick around for a long time, I would ask you to do me a favor. Stick around for just a minute. Uh, check out what he is working on and give him a follow. He's a great dude. He's working in oil paints right now. He does some... His his level of painting is way beyond the amount, the, the, the following that he has. This is a dude who needs to be discovered. He is fucking fantastic. So, uh, please stick around for just a minute. Make some noise. Uh, you know, let him, let him... Let him know we see him. Let him, let him know he's not slipping under the radar. Give that man a follow. And uh, I think you'll have a good time. He does some really, really good oil painting. If you're curious about oil painting, you're definitely going to like what he's working on over there. Um, what to say? What to say? Parting is such sweet sorrow. Really, though, thank you guys. Thank you for the raids. we got a lot of raids today. You guys are absolutely the best. Thank you for the raids. Thank you for the subs. Thank you for the follows. New viewers, welcome in. Oh my god, thank, thank you to all of you for coming out. It really, it's, it's, it's so humbling each and every time to see so many people hanging out in chat and having a good time, and I just, I hope that I can continue to, uh, to, to, to bring this many talented artists together as we continue to move forward together as, as artists and as nerds and as general jackasses. A huge thank you to my mod team, as always. We'll be back possibly Sunday, April the 4th. Uh, it's going to be a wait and see that morning, depending on how the shot goes. Failing that, we'll be back Tuesday. We're going to do some Mon Pocket Oil. Then we're back to Warcaster. I'm going to send you off now. So until next time, keep on painting. <laughs>